Okay, so welcome to the Amherst Planning Board. It is Wednesday, September 18th, 7 p.m. And we have five of our seven members here. Uh, first thing we're gonna start with is minutes. And I think we have one old minute from um, August 8th, uh, 2018. Um, now, Chris, only three of us are here that are, were present, but can everybody vote? The people who were present that night can vote, and the others will have to abstain, but I think you can just approve it based on the three of you. And three is enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, so on these minutes... Uh, is it date? It, no, it's... The, they're old. They were just sort of like lost. Oh. And then it, when we were um, doing something for tonight, it was we were like, oh, these never got approved. For, oh. okay. Maybe it was like summertime loss. Anyways, it, does anyone have any um, comments or mm -hmm. issues about it? Mm -hmm. May I make a motion to approve the minutes? Please do. So I'm making a motion to approve the minutes of August 8, 2018. Second. Is there any other comments? If not, um, to approve, say, uh, raise your hand. So the three that were there approve. Uh, no, or abs so we have two that abstain. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that goes back in. Um, okay, so now um, hmm. we're going to change the order a bit. I've uh, had a request that we jump to old business item um, 6B which is the Apple Brook uh, Cluster Subdivision, and we have um, Mr. Tom Reedy here to um, explain this very small thing we need to do. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of Apple Brook West. Um, so yeah, somewhat, I guess, serendipitously, we asked for something and hopefully uh, those meeting minutes now that have been approved, um, hopefully we can get a couple of things accomplished. This is relatively straightforward, so um, without going into too much background about the subdivision, we uh, received the certificate of compliance, or performance rather, for the, uh, we had signed a covenant saying that we won't sell any of the lots until certain infrastructure is done. Um, and this, so this is typical with all subdivisions. We came back and we got that um, certificate releasing um, seven of the lots. We didn't release lot four, that's still under the covenant. What happened since that time though is we all, then came back in April and got, uh, of this year, and had an ANR endorsed by the planning board. So we're actually going to closing on Friday and so that's why it's the late date of this. Um, and the uh, buyer's attorney said, well, wait a second, the plan that your certificate of performance references is the old plan, because we had not done these changes yet, and technically part of lot three is the one that's getting purchased. Uh, what I've highlighted here in green was um, especially the one towards the open space there in itself was part of the open space. And the open space was not released because ultimately that is either staying with uh, the homeowners association or on the southerly side going to the town. Um, and so the long and the short of it is those portions which at least here and here and over here are still technically under the covenant. So all we're asking you to do is to do what you did um, last year, but just to update the plan reference to be this plan so that when we say lot three is being released, it is all of lot three and it's exactly what is going to be conveyed. If I've confused you, I'm very sorry. It's not what I meant to do. So lot four is still held. The town engineer has said that there's been enough infrastructure done that it's all good and just to hold for and you have a closing on Friday and you just realize that the latest plan had not been tied to the certificate of performance mm -hmm. which you signed and was recorded so we're just re-releasing it and just updating it to make reference to this plan which is recorded at the registry of deeds 
an oversight on my part. I, it, I should have caught it when I came in for the ANR, but I didn't even think of it. Is there any question? Yeah, Chris? There are just a few little pieces that weren't shown on Mr. Reedy's plan up here that have changed, and I'm going to pass around um, a drawing that shows everything that's changed, just so you can have the full picture. But the things that I'm showing don't really relate to Mr. Reedy's need to sell lot three. Or the certificate of performance, because what Chris will show you, she has it, I think, in darker green. Those parts were already released because they were formerly part of, like, right here where my cursor is. You see where the hatched line is? That was where the former lot two line was. So when you released lot two, it included this area. But now that area is part of the open space. So I didn't include that as part of this presentation because um, there's no encumbrance on lot two over there. There is here because the line's moving in the other direction onto the open space. We just take one. So I think what Chris has done is shown the additional changes. Um, but they don't have any impact on their certificate of uh, performance. But this is, and then you just, but this is what we're approving and voting on, that this is the latest and greatest and most that, current Yes, that, lines. that is the plan that you endorsed back in April of this year, that this certificate of performance applies to that plan. Janet? I just have a quick question. The open space between lot three and lot two is open space for the homeowners? It, there's a lot of drainage infrastructure in there. And so um, as part of the cluster subdivision, we have to provide a certain amount of open space. And we can do a couple of things with it. We can give it to the homeowners association. We can give it to the conservation commission. Or we can um, give it to some conservation trust. Because this is really the drainage infrastructure for the site, and I don't have that plan here, but this is where like the detention basin is. Um, and we've talked to Dave Zomek about what he wants here, and the town is going to get this. And if you drive by, you'll see that there's some trees up here. Eventually, the town is going to get a trailhead right here to access, um, I think, the, the trolley line, I think is what it's called, way in the back here. So this is just was determined not to be useful to the town, and so it is being maintained, and it is the responsibility of the homeowners association because it does provide that drainage infrastructure for the entire site. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, does the public have any questions? Um, Chris, anything else to add? You just need to um, make a motion to vote mm -hmm. to release these lots, and then I have the certificate. And the one that you got um, via email and in your packets has a date of September 17th on it. But today is the 18th, so we have a fresh a copy with the correct date on it. So it's all ready for your signature if you vote to release these lots. <clears throat> so if I hear a motion. So I'm going to make a motion to approve the re-release of lots 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8 of SUB 2007-00006. Someone want to second that? Second. Thank you, Jack. Uh, any other <coughs> questions, clarifications? Okay, if not, um, for approval, show a sign of hands. Uh, that looks unanimous. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking me out of order and for allowing me to come here at all. So I'm going to circulate this um, document here, and I'd like you to sign it, if you would, and, and return it to me by the end of the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Great. Chris, that needs to be notarized. Do you have a, is somebody, your notary, or? The town clerk has um, copies of your signatures, or will have copies of your signatures, and she can notarize this. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our public hearings, uh, site plan review and special permits. Uh, this was for 7.05. It's about 7.15. Um, so we're going to continue from July 24th, 2019, SPR 2019-08, uh, Javier Campos of Adams and Ruxton for Bank of America, 
360 College Street. Uh, this is a request for site plan review approval to install new light posts and fixtures to provide better illumination, safety, and security for the Bank of America ATM. Commercial Zone District Map 15A, Parcel 28. So I assume we have somebody here to speak on that. If you want to come forward and introduce yourself. <laughs> My name is Dorothy Ostrowski from Adams and Ruxton. Um, I did see the email that went out earlier in regards to one of the board members that is not here this evening. Um, I believe that the requests that were made during the July hearing um, were answered by the engineer and sent to the board for review. So I believe that this evening we were going to receive comments on that. Um. They did come and we looked at the plans and we had some issues and I did see a letter in our packet of um, comments back and some were clear like that's great uh, that the fixtures went to 30k the Kelvin instead of mm -hmm. the 40 um, and we understand why they can't be on motion sensor detectors um, but it was brought up that uh, we had concerns about the uh, posts that were put in, um, about the location and the look and where the lights were. And we had asked for the photovoltaic study to be redone to see if you could push the poles to the other side of the driveway instead of on the inner part, push them to the outer. And it says in the letter, that they that were unable to do They so. were unable to meet the bank standard in compliance area um, because, you know, it's a whole strip mall. Correct. But, of course, you're all just working for the Bank of America and trying Correct. to light the walkway there. But we're looking at it holistically that it's an entire parking lot. Um, and we do have your reprint of the photovoltaic um, just curiosity wise, what is the number that they're trying to reach for their area of compliance? Um, I would have to go back and get that. Um, I am not prepared to answer that um, based on what their number they're looking for. Um, I will suggest um, we came across this issue also in other towns where um, there is not a very large area to place these lights. There are different options based on, instead of the larger pole bases, we can do something where it's more of just a pole into the sidewalk that also allows for the illumination. I can send you and forward you that. Um, I believe what is in here, um, based on the engineer's drawings, is what the bank requires. I'm not sure what Amherst is looking for, particularly, um, or what you would allow. I don't know if that's something that you can provide for us so we can take it back to the engineer that does the plans or what would be acceptable for the town? Well, one thing you just said is putting them in the sidewalk, but I think wouldn't that be problematic because that's public way. It would is have it? to be in on, on your landlord's property. Um, and the other problem with these bases or large bollards is there was only 20 feet between Correct. the property line and the 18-foot parking spaces. Correct. So that was 20 feet, which is bare minimum for allowing two cars to pass. And now with those in place, it narrows it to 17 feet. So that's one issue why we're pushing back on the locations being um, undesirable. And it's only 17 feet then from the back of the space for a car to back up. Some cars are longer than 17 feet. It becomes difficult to maneuver around the, the base. So even if you reduce the base, it's still um, not enough to pass. It's not enough to pass, and it's still an issue for cars. It's a hazard. We're setting up a situation sure. that cars could easily be hitting these poles, which sure. nobody wants. Um, does the uh, members have any other like um, issues? I know we all saw um, David's um, comments, which I think a lot of us agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack? I'd be willing to. I mean, he, he, it was a good email. I can read it. Yeah, so please. So everybody knows. Um, again, this is from Dave Levenstein. Uh, he, he's not here. Uh, right. Sent an email. He said, I have given considerable thought to the request for the site plan review. 
uh, on behalf of Bank of America for approval to install the new light posts and fixtures to the site at 360 College Street. I do not believe that this site plan review should be granted. In addition, I believe that the two posts previously installed for this purpose should be removed and the parking restored to its previous condition, parking lot. The applicant did not offer, to my mind, a strong rationale for its decision to proceed with installation of these light post bases. The area at this intersection is very well illuminated and no specific evidence of public safety was offered. The only rationale offered to my recollection was that the site and its illumination did not meet some corporate national standard. In fact, Bank of America commenced construction contrary to the zoning bylaw. Uh, the applicant did not perform sufficient due diligence prior to its construction, mm -hmm. further undermining its rationale for proceeding. The proposed installation seems solely for the benefit of one business at this site without any regard for the other businesses located there, for the public interest or for the town's interest in the site. More importantly, the lights in their base as currently proposed pose, in my view, an observation of the site and both the site plan review as well as the subsequent oh. visits to the site to be a threat to public safety and parking. The parking lot is not adequately configured as um, Christine has said. Um, I'm just moving on here. Mm -hmm. Finally, I am highly concerned about the likely light pollution that this change in illumination will present at an intersection designated by the town as an emerging village center. Although the proposed lights may meet dark sky compliance, there is nonetheless an intention to increase illumination that will undermine the town's desire to make this area more pedestrian friendly. David Levenstein. Mm -hmm. Any comment to that? Or? I think the only comment going in retrospect of all of this is um, typically for electrical light packages or upgrades that we do for banks or any other projects, we don't pull building permits. It's always been electrical permits, and we were issued an electrical permit for this with no question or anything. So we proceeded with this project based on an electrical permit that we were approved by the town. So whatever suggestions are made, I am more than happy to bring back to Bank of America, but it was a town that issued us the permit to begin this, and whatever happens going forward, I will definitely bring back to Bank of America. It is ultimately not our decision what happens. It is yours, and I will bring it back to um, our client. Okay. But the due diligence and things like that, we did not undermine. I just want to put that on the record, is we were not looking to undermine anybody in Amherst. We did come out. We did receive an electrical permit which we have done multiple times for other electrical light packages. We proceeded as we would with any other project. We were asked to cease and desist from our project, of which we did, and then we proceeded with this um, hearings and things. So I just want that on the record, that this was not something that was done to undermine anything from the town of Amherst. Thank you for that. Yeah. Janet? Um, I was at one of these businesses, and I was leaving, and the <coughs> owner said, be careful backing up because of this and I thought this was a, that was a good point. It was hard to go around, and especially if there's like snow piled in the winter. Or... I actually visited the site for the first time this evening. Um, I recently took over Adams and Ruxton this year, um, and this is definitely a new change. Um, I did visit this site earlier today and just looking at what we could do. So it's really ultimately bank standards versus towns and what towns want. So I get it. I was out there, and I have an SUV, and it was difficult to back up. So, um, you know, whatever... You know, I can only take back to our clients and go from there. <laughs> I think where um, some of the conflict happens is we look at this as a town building, a Correct. town parking lot, and, you know, your client is focused on entry to and from the bank. Correct. And we're looking at the rest. And actually, at our site visit, there was evidence of, you know, homelessness on the side and the back of the bank to the point where there was actually a person living there. Um, so when I look at the sides, it's great you're containing the light, but it's also creating a very, very dark parking lot mm -hmm. that affects safety. You know, we read our, our bylaw and we're looking out for the safety of the public. There's also a new restaurant going in there, and it, you know, so there's going to be people coming in in the dark in the evenings there. And when I look at the photovoltaic, it, it's just really dark. The other option is that the larger cars can't park in front to visit, whether it be the bank or to go to the restaurant or whatever. So they're going to try to 
you know, if they realize this, if they're a frequent bank customer and they keep coming there, they're going to realize it's too tight for me to park there and they're going to park on the outer edges of the parking mm. lot. So maybe the bank does need to widen its thought on, you know, as you were saying, your, your um, foot candles for the pathway right in front of their ATM, but it, it really does have to maybe look at the whole building, which maybe that does have to bring in discussion with the actual owner of the building, okay. because Bank of America is sort of getting trapped in the issue of the whole building. Okay. Chris? Is there a way that the bank and uh, Adams Ruxton could put the lights on the building and not have them out in the parking lot? That's definitely something we can bring back to the engineer who, um, from GMR, and ask them because we have done that for other buildings. So, and just one other thought to that: yeah. going back to the last um, time y'all came, you brought a light fixture. I think it's somewhere in here. It's fairly small. The Cree lights, you know. And there's mm -hmm. you could have them the co more cobra. You could have double head, you know. So when you were running the, rerunning that photovoltaic study, I'm assuming you used the same light heads that you had originally proposed, but they could be changed. Mm -hmm or be mounted off the building. So anyways, that's as far as we'll engineer it, but does the members, anyone else have any other issues? Besides the fact, you know, it's really ugly too. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> but that's extra points. Um, okay, so uh, when would you all think you'd come back with? Uh, with when is the next, how quickly? <clears throat> Um, yeah, Chris. Mm -hmm. So the planning board is meeting on October 2nd, and they're meeting on October 16th. Um, October 2nd seems pretty soon. Yeah. Maybe the 16th, the 16th would be better. Yep. Okay. That gives us time to um, have GMR revise drawings, look at different options of what they can do, get in touch with the landlord versus lighting more of the parking lot versus just what they're looking at. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Are you going to move to continue the public hearing to the uh, 16th then? Someone want to mumble that? I'm going to make a motion to continue the public hearing. Until October 16th. Until October 16th. This project. Janet, thank you. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. Unanimous. Until the 16th. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now we'll move to um, Southeast Street Court Housing. If uh, the representatives for that want to come forward and um, give us a second here to get organized. So this is, uh, Right, so this, uh, we will continue this. Um, we're going to continue this public hearing that was started on July 24th <laughs> and continue to August 27th and continues tonight. It's SPR 2019-07 and SPP. 2019-04, Amir, uh, wow, <laughs> so, Southeast Street, oh, haven't seen that before, Southeast Street Court Housing 133 and 143 Southeast Street, joint public hearing to request site plan review approval to construct a new three-story mixed-use building with 62 apartments. 
1,358 square feet of retail space and associated site improvements and work in the town right of way under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw and request a special permit to modify the front and side setback requirements under footnote A of table 3, section 6 of the zoning bylaw. B-VC zoning district map 15C parcels 3 and 4. So thank you. Welcome back if you can all introduce yourself. And thank you for your patience these last couple of meetings. We've had really long meetings, and I know you've been pushed back, bounced <laughs> around and everything. So thank you. Right. Well, the mayor's already introduced himself. I'm Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, I'm Amir Mikchi, the owner of the project. More grand architect. Thanks. Um, wow, it's been a while, but um, I think I'm going to try to start with um, I submitted this list of the <clears throat> changes to the plan, and um, I don't know if you want me to run through all of those or just maybe go through real quick and if you have questions on any of them. Um, we did add wall packs on the building. There was concern about lighting that walk that's right in front of the building. Um, I'll flip over to the photometric plan shortly. Um, we did add, we could really only add one more parking space within this parking lot, and that was, whoops. Are you seeing the cursor? Yes. Maybe it's this one. May I note that um, the list was contained in your packet for the 27th, um, when you didn't hear testimony that night, but we asked you to hold on to your packet. So if you don't have the list, we can go make copies of it for you. Does oh. anyone need the, Who, you, is the... Is it the site management plan that we're looking at? No. Yeah. No, it was, it was just know? a summary to try to make things easier. Ah, I found it. Single sheet. Yeah. And um, it has 13 items on it. We have way too much paper with this. <laughs> yeah, there's always this too much paper. Oops, let's make a copy. I think um, Pam went to copy. I have one. So you have one. I need that too. So she made one too. Which is maybe. Okay. Do you have that? I have it. So do you guys want to share that? You guys can share. Okay. Um, okay. Down, uh, number one, I just talked about the wall packs. Uh, and we'll look at the photometric plan shortly. Number two, we um, there was uh, comments about lack of parking. And obviously we're um, requesting a waiver or special permit for the uh, parking, which is, again, one space per unit, 62 units. And then we had um, the requirement was four spaces for the um, retail shop. So that would have made 66 spaces. Um, this, the, originally, we had 67 spaces shown. Um, and we were able to add one space right here by making this island smaller. Um, and that's really the only place we could add any spaces um, within the back portion of this um, uh, site. So there are 68 total spaces shown on the plan right now. Um, we add, we added bike racks or bike parking here at the front of the building. It seemed like a logical place because this was, um, you know, a major or one of the main entries from the street side. Um, we moved the retail space. Previously, the retail space was here in the center portion of this building that faces Southeast Street. Um, it was moved down to this end. So the two retail spaces would be here, which will help facilitate a better um, loading and unloading um, sequence because the trucks can be able to pull in on the driveway and basically pull in into this parking lot and unload versus um, potentially having to stop on Southeast Street and unload, which obviously we don't want to do. And if they pulled into the lot, it would have created more headaches to get um, goods out of the trucks and then, you know, walk them down the sidewalk and into the retail here. So we tried to, um, Amir was agreeable and to move the retail there. That's the closest um, location to uh, parking, a parking area. Um, the walkways, number five, 
were all increased to be six feet wide within the town right of way, so this green space in the front. Um, again, number six, we have a revised lighting plan, which I'll um, uh, flip to in a minute. We did submit um, trip generation numbers produced uh, or prepared by um, our engineer in our office. Um, we can talk about that if you want. It should be in your packet. Uh, basically, it says uh, on a weekday period, 24-hour period, this project could be expected to generate around 466 total vehicle trips. On a weekday AM peak period, um, it's estimated that this project could generate 40 trips in and out. And on a weekday PM peak, 42 trips in and out. Um, can I just ask a question to add on that? Yep. To put it in perspective, what is the vehicle trips per day on that road? I don't know the numbers on, you know, we, we, that's a good point. We should have checked with engineering here in town, but I can probably say that like Route 9, which is the closest intersection, it's got to be, I would imagine somewhere, you know, between 10 and 15,000 um, on, on that Route main 9. road. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Southeast Street, you know, it's, it's a pretty, a lot of people use it as a, a maybe a, you call it a shortcut, if you will, to kind of move north-south on the east side of town. Um, I mean, I do it, you know, I used to live in um, Echo Hill, and I kind of cut down this way to get to, um, you know, over the notch or even go to Northampton sometimes instead of driving on Route 9. But Southeast Street's a pretty busy street in itself. We could. We so could we, check those numbers. You could, but we could probably conservatively be safe and say it could be four or 5,000 trips per day, uh, and if this is going to add 40. I'm just trying to get perspective on yeah, what that I, means. I would, yeah, I mean, I would think that would be a good number um, if we were pulling one out of a hat. Um, it's, you know, 4,000. Uh, in, in a daytime period, I would imagine there's got to be thousands of trips going, right. you know, up and down. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, on the traffic report, on the first page, it says, for the average daily traffic, the rate per dwelling is 6.6 .6 vehicles per day. So that is each apartment. What does that mean? It's the last sentence of the first page. Oh, yeah. Okay. So does that mean that each unit will be going in and out of the apartment three times a day? Or, you know, leaving and coming back six times? Let's There's... During the during that, let's see. This one says AM peak. So we're we're dealing with just the AM in one hour, the one hour of the morning time at the peak traffic. That's what this paragraph is referring to. Mm -hmm. So there's it's expected. This is what the um, ITE manual tells us that this type of use will or a apartment use. I think that's what we're talking about. Yep, apartment will generate 6.65 .65 vehicles per day. That's uh, uh, going in and out with, um, hold on, let me read this again, AM20. So this is, uh, I think, oh, I apologize. I think okay. what she's that, saying is correct. Yeah, that's for the entire day per dwelling. Mm -hmm. So every dwelling is expected to generate 6.65 trips in a 24-hour period. Three in and out. It's a standard they get from their technical manual. So that's per dwelling unit? Yep. So if you multiply that by 62, you should get 200 and, well, is that right? But that's you over should the get, whole You should day. get 412 rounded up. And then on a, um, we're assuming it's a 50-50 split in and out, so there, there's the on the back page, 206 going in, 206 going out every day. So are you assuming one person is going to be going in and out every uh, day, or are there two people in the dwelling? Or like, where does that come from? Because that seems like a lot of cars I'm, and people moving in and out. I'm not so. assuming it. It's what they tell us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think that they're just going by a design book. It seems high to me, personally. It, it is but, high, yeah. yeah. But better to over-engineer than under. You'd be surprised. I mean, when, if you sit down and look at it, like somebody's going to go to the store, and then they're going to come home, and then they, oh, i got to run out to the post office. That's another two trips. So it's not 
unfathomable to think that somebody's going to be in and out that many times in, in a day. But it's trying to capture it, an average right, for each right. unit. Mm -hmm. it's conservative. So yeah. some might go in and out seven times a Correct. day, and Correct. someone may yeah. have their car yep. sit there for three days. It, it, or they're, not have a car at all. Or, well, that's a word. And I will <laughs> say that residential use is something that's not hard to study. There are a lot of case studies for residential use, whereas in some certain uses, like for, I'll just throw out like the, the new marijuana shops, we're having trouble generating numbers for those because there's no data yet you know, for that type of thing. But for like a residence or residential use apartments, uh, single family homes or whatever, there's lots of data out there, so. And it's set by this ITE, International uh, uh, in, Transportation uh, Engineer? Yeah, I don't know what the I Engin stands for, but it's for- Maybe International yeah. or, is that, or no, because it's- Institute, Institute, Institute of Traffic of Engineers. That's yep. it. Yep. <laughs> Um, we say the acronym all the time and you don't really think about it. <laughs> right. Any other questions uh, on the traffic study or? Um, or traffic the, trip generation the numbers. Chip, uh, yeah, yeah, right, the trip generation. Jack. Uh, are, are the elevation views updated with, with those changes? The ele you mean of the building? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'll flip to those too. Um, where were we? So, okay, number eight, car charge station. We, it's hard to see on this plan, it's not shown, but we did add a car charge station here in this corner. Um, what do you want? Oh, nine, you're, did you do it? Number, yeah, number nine, number, got it, got it. Got number it. nine, um, we added, there was talk about seating, so we added permanent seats, two benches, and a trash receptacle in the circular plaza, um, which was also moved to be out, down outside the, um, the retail space. Uh, number 10, we added a small um, you know, yard space so people could come out and sit or, and or even you know, grill something maybe. But there's, you know, there, granted there is not a lot of green space. We were envisioning that a lot of people would come out and, and potentially be using the plaza space, you know, at the residents as well as whoever might be using it uh, from the, uh, in association with the retail use. Um, but again, the limited space on the site, you know, this was the only um, corner in which we could add a, a small green space or usable space, so that would be a, a maintained lawn space. Could you give an estimate on the size of that area? Um, it's probably, I'd say on average, 15 by, 15 feet wide by 60. How wide is the building? 60 plus. Okay. So maybe it's 65-ish in length. Um, number 11, we shifted this crosswalk here. I don't remember why we did it. I think it was shown originally to be a little bit closer to one of the it's, bus stops, so we I made it I think it's equidistant, equidistant yep. between the bus stops. Um, we revised the water connection. There was a comment from um, the DPW that we showed the water connection to the incorrect stub that's on Southeast Street. There was a couple of stubs coming in um, from the street that, that are that are in there, I think Mr. Mitchie had one installed at one point for future development. Um, and then the uh, architectural plans have been revised and I'll flip to the, um, I think that might be, whoops. Next slide. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, right here. Okay. So the top, the top um, is the view from the street. You can see where the awnings are shown that those are the retail. Um, Could um, you use the clicker spaces. or the pointer? I think we have a pointer. Oh, sorry, um, well, I've lost it. There we go. So these would be the retail spaces here. It's a to again, total of 1,200 square feet. Um, that's that main door at the northeast corner. This is the view from the other side. This should work. Looking east. Hold on. Yes, looking, yeah, looking east. And then these are the other elevations. The top one is basically looking south, if you, as if you're standing at the uh, Florence Bank building, and then this is the opposite side on the bottom. Um, 
There was a question about um, uh, sight distance, so I just went out and took some photos of uh, standing where the new driveway would be, and you can see looking south and north, there's almost, you know, well, I can't use the word infinite, but the sight distance is, you know, more, much more than 500 feet. Um, so there's no real obstructions or anything uh, at the um, uh, Southeast Street where the new driveway would be intersecting it. And then I just wanted to uh, reinforce the idea. There was talk about the, the size of the building, and we have a, Roy produced this uh, cross section, which I have a slide of, but just in terms of size of building, you know, this, this would not be dissimilar to the Kendrick Place building here on Triangle Street. And although this is a five-story building and we have a three, it's still the tallest building in the area um, set in amongst a lot of other commercial type um, um, uses. That's the cross section there. You can see the, um, again, in relation to the uh, uh, Florence Bank building. That, again, that's the short side of the building at the Florence Bank. And then this is the proposed um, cross uh, sectional view at, from Southeast Street. So it's about twice as long as the short side of the building and not quite twice as tall. Um, you know, it's, it's a three-story building. Does that include the three-foot elevation or not? The Is there, from the, the street? Did you? Is the, the building will be at, higher is, is, is from, it, than the street. Is the relationship of the ground floor of the new building accurate to the Florence Bank? So you, it's even with the road, pretty much. I think it's pretty close. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. That's why you have to bring in the fill to right. fill in the public way, yeah. So because the houses that right, exist now are higher. high, and then it dips low, yeah. and then right. it comes back up to the road. So that's the, the rest of the landscape. Well, that site is low. Yes. Right. And, and the houses are starting to get about the middle of the road. Right. right. The, the existing houses that are there are actually on little mounds. So they're already <laughs> elevated. So if we're putting this kind of large building in there, in, in place of those two, we're basically having to fill that to that level of where the existing houses are. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason for the, for the fill. And I forget, I think. Oh, and this was just an aerial view. So that's that's the Florence Bank building. This is the site with the two houses. Um, you can kind of see more or less in footprint that there's a lot of commercial buildings in this area that are, you know, size <coughs> much larger than a single family home here. So the new building would basically stretch, you know, from this fence back here down to this driveway. And then, you know, reaching back, it stretches out to about here. Um, so the length of it is about the same length as the Florence Bank building. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not, you know, a lot bigger in terms of its footprint. Um, I think that was it. There was, um, oh, the photometric I wanted to flip to. That was a, that was a revision. All right, so this, this photometric was redone using the, the fixture you see there on the left. Um, it is the town standard. We got this information kind of late from DPW, but it's a Hall of Fame fixture. So I contacted the company and one of their reps, and we got this put together. It doesn't have the, the foot candle contours, but all the numbers, and I know you can't maybe not be able to read them that well, but if you look at the, um, the plan, the foot candle levels around at the property are at zero or 0.1. And around the property, there's really, there aren't any abutters. It's conservation land. Um, and obviously, we have bright spots. Whoops. Um, wow, I just realized this is not easy to see from a distance. But there's four, there's four lights in the back parking lot, one here, one here, one in this island, and then one here. There are. Um, two, no, there's only one light here in this parking lot right there on the end. There's four lights now. We used to only have three lights in the right of way, but there's four now. And could you point those out? Yep, one here at the, well, actually, it was located here at the corner of the walk. I 
was trying to get him to move it down to here, but he said, no, you're getting a better lighting level on the walkways is what, you know, and that's more important than lighting the entry road where, you know, you've got headlights working for you. Um, so there's one light here, there's one right there near the crosswalk, there's one here at the bus stop, and then there's one more here as you move north. Um, and I think, you know, that'll create a nice pattern or rhythm on the street. Um, but there's adequate lighting here all along the sidewalk and in the front of the building there's wall packs. Um, we purposely mounted these at a 10 foot height. Um, you know, get them above your head um, and to create, you know, like a line up in the building. These are all downcast. And then there's two other wall packs at the rear doors, but these are just at eight, you know, like a more of a typical um, porch light height, you know, eight feet at the entry doors. Um, and again, you know, there, obviously there's um, quite a bit of lighting along the street and sidewalk. Chris. Um, so, Chris. Oh, sorry. So um, the latest lighting plan I have, and I've been out of town, is this one here. And I don't have the one that Mr. Lou is showing, and I wondered if That's he had one. submitted it to us and I've just missed it, or has he maybe not submitted I, it? I, I thought I sent that through, but I could be wrong. It's been this kind of like back and forth with all the paperwork, and I might not have sent it to the planning staff if you don't have it. Do you guys have it in your pack? I can't find That's uh, what I've been digging here. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. I, mean, I apologize yeah. then. Um, I thought I sent it through. Um, I know I sent it to you. <laughs> I don't believe but, we have pictures of these wall lights either that you're talking about. Okay, I don't have a copies of those. They're just, they're very basic, you know. Um, I have two copies of these. Yeah, those are the previous ones we had, but the wall the lights. The SL2 and the SL1? Yeah. Which yeah. one are you they're, they're still labeled the, the same on this plan, but the SL1s and SL2s are this style, which is the town standard yes. used at Triangle Street. And which one are you using, one or two? They're both the same. They're, it's just a different light distribution, if you will, for that one versus yeah. two. But it's the same style fixture. Same style, different bulb or spray. <coughs> Spread, is, yeah, so different So your pattern. photovoltaic, which did you use, one or two? Well, this plan uses both. I can't re see. I'm sorry. So the, like, for instance, this one down here is an SL1, and okay. this one's an SL2. Okay. The SL2 probably has a more boxy That's, distribution for yep. coverage, whereas these have more linear yep. type of distribution. And then I think, let's see, on the street we have SL1s um, pretty much so that they're uh, more elongated, elongated to, light, yeah. to, to light up the sidewalk. So here, I guess here we've got in the park back, yeah, that makes sense. There's two SL2 fixtures in the center of the parking lot to kind of throw light in all directions, whereas the SL1s would throw light mostly linearly this way and forward. And where are the four in the back again? I'm sorry. The four in the, in the park. Okay, there's yeah. one in the island yeah. here, one in this island, one on the end here, and then one on right there. On so there's this, uh, none near your entrance lobby. Entrance lobby? Oh, or, where they go in the building. Uh, well, this is the main entrance from the parking That's a, lot side. Right. So there's a wall pack there at the Just door. Just one wall pack. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to remember is if you, you have to mentally overlay the landscaping plan because you've got a heck of a lot of trees back right. there. Which trees are great, but they mm -hmm. block the light. Yeah. And in fact, um, I did look at that. and Obviously, mm. the trees don't show, but we adjusted some of the locations here. I think the only one that was a real conflict was this one because we had a tree like right here and right here. I think I might have moved, now let me go back. Well, you didn't have one near the crosswalk before. So my concern was the closest one was the southbound bus stop. And you had, right, you can see there were two trees in between right. where the light was I think and the I, crosswalk. I think I ended up moving this tree because th that might be the, the fixture right there, if you see that. Yeah, there's one, uh, there's one, and then there, uh, this one's hidden amongst the line work, but there's another one back here. So this tree, you know, uh, was in conflict. We could even, 
I mean, it, you know, we, we could even slide that up to the north, but I think that there's plenty of um, space for both elements to be there. And then this one certainly makes sense, I think, at the crosswalk intersection. Oh, yeah, you know? for mid-block, yeah. Yeah. And then this one is not in conflict with any trees in that location. Uh, well, actually, you said if, if they were trying to place it just to the north of that walk, yep. it's not right putting much light in the driveway. Um, it's, there's enough light. I think the, the parking in that area is lighted up to... And I'm gonna, I might refer back here, but if we can read these numbers in the driveway, does that say 1.2? So we, we are, we're still having much more than the minimum required. The minimum standard for parking lot is generally half of a handle. Yeah. So there's over one uh, in that look, you know, in that area. Only my thing to remind you is it is the public way. Mm -hmm. So I know you're thinking parking lot, but I'm thinking public yep. way sidewalk. Okay. With two bus stops. Right. Correct. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if he could even mark up this All right. plan. Just because this is not. So we don't have a current light plan is, or planting plan right now, which is why we're sort of suffering right. here. Right. Yeah. I guess that was. You know. I just. I thought I had sent it through, and I apologize for not that you don't have it, or that you haven't been able to see it before tonight. Um, do you I don't know. so I, I just I had mentioned at the last meeting also that um, you know if you put your pedestrian hat on and you think about where people walk to and if they got off the northbound bus and then they're going to cross over on the crosswalk mm -hmm. and they want to head to your front door in the lobby on the top corner they're not gonna to wanna to backtrack and then right. go through your right. half circle patio. Mm -hmm. I had mentioned shoving that up back up 15 feet so that the center of the walkway matches the crosswalk. I know it doesn't perfectly align with yeah. your um, businesses, and I don't know architecturally if, if that's still desirable, but for flow of pedestrians, it would just make a lot more sense. Right, well one thing. So right now, if you were taking the northbound bus and you got off, yep, you got and off you here. cross, yeah, and you're walking, you cross at the crosswalk, and then you want to head to the front door. People don't like to backtrack and yep. then yep. come back and then head back up to the door. If they slide that half circle patio up about 15 feet, then you mm -hmm. cross. And it also, for a public way, I think it makes more of a continuity and flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. They'd walk right into the patio, do you see, and then they bear right I, up I into the front door. I think an easy door. thing to do would even take this section of walk and move it yeah. up here. You could, if, you know, right. I mean, and that to me, I, I kind of like that because I don't, I prefer that the walk didn't kind of cut through the middle of the space. So the space is a little bit more usable and sacred, if you will, and, you know, you can have more, you can do more with it if the walk or the flow wasn't cutting right through the middle. So if, if if you're amenable to that idea, we could move this walkway up here and just kind of like have it come straight across. And that way this person could either continue up this walk to the door or enter into the retail area. Or enter into the door again. Well, I thought they can't go in the one on the bottom because that's an out only door. This one here, Roy? Is, is that going to be controlled? Are, are residents going to be able to get in? So, so re this so is different than way, Chris and I, what we talked about. So they can't, they can, it's not just the two lobby entrances. They can also at any yes. time go in the south door and the west door. So the same, it would be residents. the same residents. For residents that would be the same access for all the four doors, yes. for the private doors. And these are, these are whatever, controlled by the, re the tenant, the retail tenant. That's good to know, but I still think coming across the crosswalk and flowing right in, because then they have the option, depending on where they live in the building, to go yeah. left or go yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we can do that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they need to. That's a downtown yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, it's us. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to so, have some time to look at this. Yeah, I'd need to see. I think we need a, a drawing that shows where the street lights are, where all the lights are, and where the trees are. 
um, just to make sure that the light is where it needs to be. Um, yeah, and right now my I'm a little concerned about the driveway. The okay. amount mm -hmm. I can't read the numbers. What are the numbers right where the road meets the driveway? It's public way, but oops. Uh, so let me I'll go through. I think. And do they run the photovoltaic with the trees? Like, do they no, look at, they don't. They, that's but what you, I thought. You they also just, have to consider, I know that there's an existing street light here on this side, at the bus, right across from the bus stop. And I, is there a, a light, do you know, near this existing bus stop? I don't think so. If you pull up your photos, we might see it in the line of sight. Yeah, that's true. Uh, hold on. This mouse is driving me crazy. Oh yeah? So this doesn't capture it, but the top photo, you can just see the end of the bus stop. So yeah. there's a light down further at the next driveway. What's that business? Um, Noonan Noonan the Noonan oil, Noonan. but yeah. that's pretty far down. Yeah, far down. yeah. I don't I'm, think that's going to spray yeah. to the... I don't know if you can yeah. see where the light... Oh yeah, you can see the light on the bottom photo, the, co the, the cobra head on that pole yeah. behind the 50 mile or 30 mile an hour speed limit sign. That's right across from where the new bus stop is proposed. The north, right, the southbound bus to the north, yeah. Yes, the southbound. But there's not one around this driveway way area. Let's go back to the photometric if you want. Does the overhead show? So, there it is. <laughs> oh, there it is. All right. Um, if we start, well, I don't know if you want me to read these to you, but this is 1.2. Oh, where is it with the mouse? Right there. Okay, thank you. As you move across, this is 1.2. Again, 1.2. 1. 2. Uh, 1. So 1.2, that whole line right here is 1.2. The top line, 1.7, 1.7, 1.8. And on the bottom here, we're at 0 0.7, 0 0.7, and 0 0.6 right there at the corner. But you have to really, I mean, I always have to say you have to, these photometric plans are generated as if there's no other light in the world, like you were in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So there, there is residual light, you know, from other sources. But like you said, it's surrounded by a lot of conservation land. Yeah, in but the back. my concern is it will be fine in the winter if they're deciduous trees, but in the mm -hmm. summer, okay, it could be very little light. Well, we could we could easily, I think, move that light, I think, and you know, get more light at the intersection. I think the plan we had, it actually was down it next was, to the I driveway. Think, yeah. yeah, he thought it was a, that was a better location. The 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 lighting designer for Hall of Fame had it at that, moved it to this corner, because I think, I think he felt that the pedestrian flow was more, you know, more important. Again, I can't, That's we have to it. see where the other lights are. Mm -hmm. I'm glad there is one at the crosswalk, but I think you just said it's to the north of the crosswalk. Um, it's, right. um, nope, it's, it's almost dead center, right? right there. Which now we're going to have a walkway, so it's got a budge yep. north or south, so can, maybe yep. if it goes south. I think it moves south a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and then the other one, you know, we move to the island, if you will, um, between the driveway and the, um, the east-west sidewalk. All right, well, if you can make those changes mm -hmm. and then get us the sure. lighting yeah. plan. Um, Just a point. Yeah, go ahead. I would just, when in terms of the use of the driveway, think about bikes coming in at night too that mm -hmm. they have to see. So I mean, usually a bike light is very weak. So okay, yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Any other questions on the public way and the light placement? I have one other question on the landscaping. We talk about plants. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you look at the trees and where the lights are placed. Uh, you have um, you know bushes and stuff planted on the north side, but you, as you showed with this, um, most of the southerly light is blocked, and then there's a white fence that's I don't know, 
is that six feet tall at least. Um, so, you know, is they look to be the same bushes that were being planted all over. Would you, I, they have to be low light, obviously. Yeah, yeah, we, I'm pretty sure we picked, well, we haven't touched those, uh, the, you know, changed them, like, but, but those were chosen because they're um, shade, shade type plants. Um, but, you know, I think that we added, I, you know, we wanted to keep some greenery back there so that the residents aren't just looking out and seeing the fence. And the fence is set back about five feet onto the bank's property. So there is a, it's not just a five foot strip, it's more like a 10 foot, mm -hmm. eight to 10 foot strip of um, grass there. But still, I think that some shrubs would be, you know, a welcome uh, for the, especially the residents on the first floor. So is right. I want to see them thrive and survive. And I agree. Looking out your window, if you're on first floor, it's nice to see some greenery. So it goes along the strip. And then when you got to that, um, we'll call it the backyard area, the 15 by 65, I noticed there's not any bushes along that part of the fence there. And that might be an area that does want some greenery. And I know as you're moving around trees and such, maybe you could stick a tree back there or something. I think we could. There's a pretty good tree line back there. And I know it's shown kind of, you know, you see this. This is the more or less approximately where the existing tree line is. So there's, you know, there's woods back there and not necessarily right next to the green space or, or you know, the lawn space. But you are going to be refilling and regrading. So whatever's there could be yeah, yeah. If you, changed I mean, add, or not there. Add a couple of trees back there if you'd like. You have to remember the lady who was here in July who wanted to come out of her apartment and sun herself. And that's the only place she could put a chair and sun herself. You know that? I, I think that was one of our board members was asking for an area that people could relax in the outdoors. I don't think it was so much about getting a tan, but you know, it's a 15 by 65 foot area. I'm just saying you have these bushes along a f jam between a building and a fence that are going to I hope they really are shade loving, and I just happen to notice it ends at the end of the building. So I was like, well, maybe a few of those bushes could continue along the fence in that backyard area. We could we could add some more, or you know, take out a select whatever three or four, move them here. If you're if you'd like, we can add a a flowering tree back there. What I'm not I'm. Yeah. <laughs> Maria. <laughs> so since we're on this landscaping against the building, it's kind of tied to the architecture, so I'm glad you're here. Um, on the street side, that elevation you have there, I'm a little concerned about the first floor residents. And this has always been a case with a lot of our apartments that we have coming to town where they're on the first floor against the public side. And I'm just wondering if you had any thought about, you know, the elevations are very, um, uniform from first to third floor and it seems like on the first floor I see there is landscaping there in fact some of the I, I can't see this because I'm old but um, some of the species I can't tell if they're going to eventually help scream you know people looking in because your sidewalk looks like it's only like the width of the sidewalk from the building is all the green space there is between you know, where someone's walking by, and I imagine a lot of people will be walking, there's 60 residents, and there's retail. So I'm just wondering if the first floor, you had any sort of um, idea for mitigating some of that privacy issue, um, whether it's with landscaping or architecture, but just, you know, thoughts about that. spaces down towards the south end and then two apartments and then the lobby and then one apartment in the corner. Mm -hmm. The one in the corner doesn't have any, any uh, sidewalk directly in front of it, so that was okay. So, mm -hmm. so what you say I think would, would apply to two of those apartments. I think that's a, a, a point well taken. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you, you could consider uh, making the, the glass somewhat obscure from, uh, from the outside looking in. So, so we, right. I mean, I don't mean to like design here with you. I just just wanted to know if you consider that, you know, because it's, it's yeah, good point. yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we've done that much detail yet, but it's a good point. One we should consider in the From the landscaping perspective, I mean, we do. You know, we you see 
you know, quite a few circles up there. So there are shrubs and some, um, uh, a few ornamental grasses, but it's a five foot strip and it's planted with um, shrubs. They're, they're gonna need some maintenance, but if, you know, but these are, um, we've got um, things such as um, inkberry, it's an evergreen. Uh, the Daphne, there's some Daphne there, which is also an evergreen. But those can, you know, they're, I'm gonna say that they're known to be dense plants. So it's a pretty good buffer to keep people from kind of like walking up and, you know, kind of staring in the windows, if you will. Um, so there's a kind of a landscaping buffer there to, you know, keep people from approaching the facade. And if there's anything that can be done, you know, with glazing or something, maybe, I don't know, um, to provide, you know, less transparency from the outside, maybe, yeah. or, um, some, some, you know, glass treatment. Maria, you were talking about the inner court. Um, no, and, and right, um, the public way one. Is that where you were talking about yeah, the glass? Sorry, yeah, mainly that one. But, you know, it's the same issue on the parking lot side, mm -hmm. just not as many people. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just looking at the elevations, it looks like, you know, only the retail sort of differentiates itself. But then the first floor apartments, mm -hmm. you know, have the same sill height as the upper story. So just something right, to yeah. consider. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, Yeah, and the ones in the back too. The ones in the back too. Right, the ones against the parking lot right. would you have the same issue. Would yeah. the windows be higher, do you think, than the cars' lights? Just wondering when the cars come in. This is an architect room. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, it just seems that it's just some kind of hazards that you might be able to see inside. As it is, it doesn't seem that it's that particularly raised. I mean, they don't seem to be particularly raised, so it seems that people who park in the back could actually look into the apartment. So, so I'm, you know, I don't think we'd be opposed to um, adding more uh, plants in the in in the on the parking lot side either to help with you know that aspect. And um, can I? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't know if it's just a matter of plants, but maybe you could think about different kind of glazing that is in two different sections, the lower part that is yeah. maybe translucent, the upper part, because I don't think you want to completely make translucent yeah. first floor apartments. They'd be <laughs> horrible. But, um, but I think there are ways that you could actually break it into something that is maybe more opaque or translucent in the bottom and then more transparent. So I think that's probably what we're trying to hope mm -hmm. for sure. than sure. just landscape, because I don't think landscape enough will right. take care of okay. this problem. It's too close to the parking lot, even in the back. So. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I have more comments on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I mean, another comment that goes to the elevations that I would just like to talk about because we've done that for other projects as well. This is a fairly substantial, I mean, this is a fairly substantial building. And as you mentioned yourself, once it's built, it's gonna be pretty prominent. So I just wonder if, as you are rethinking the elevations, you could also consider about somehow breaking down or articulating certain parts of the building so that you could give a rhythm to the building that is a little bit less homo homogeneous and can actually allow us to understand the building in smaller parts as well. So this has been done in different places in town. I'm sure good architect that you are, you could conceive of it, but it's just that it seems that it's too monotonous and too much in one piece as it is. And once it's gonna be built, um, it's gonna be very present. So in the past, we have both gotten a lot of comments from the public, and also we've been really attentive to this for every project that comes in front of us. So this is my major comment about the elevations, I think, that I'd like you to consider. It doesn't, I don't understand them to be completely finished, so I think you still have time to think about it. Okay. 
some softening would be, would, I'm not an architect, so it, it, it's a lot. <sighs> any other comments about any of the issues? Janet, do you have something? Um, I have a big question about the parking because it doesn't seem adequate. And um, the requirement is two spaces per unit and only one is being provided and the comment has come from Florence Bank that they're concerned that that parking is inadequate and people will start using their lot, especially in the winter. The public have mentioned that there's not enough parking um, and there's, you know, it doesn't meet the bylaws requirement and so I'm not sure why there is so little parking on the lot and, you know, the only reason there's so little parking is because the big you, you want so many units and the, the building is so big. So I don't really understand, you know. And then one of the members of the public pointed out is there's no other place to park, and so it's not like you can put it into a neighborhood street or somewhere else. Is that, you know, it seems very likely to me that you know one or two people will be living in the apartment. Um, maybe more if they had a child or something, and people will have visitors and parties, and there's just not enough parking, and it doesn't meet the bylaw. That's my. And then, in terms of circulation, on on this design, I'm concerned that as trucks are unloading, people can't really drive in and out, and also people can't you know unload their groceries you know near the front, or if they are moving in, there's no place to put a, a you know any size truck to kind of you know unload near the front, and so there's not. There's just a poor movement here, even with the very limited parking. Uh, I should follow up. This, uh, pro this project was in the um, making, as Chris knows, for a few years. And from the very beginning, uh, that was the concern that we had about the parking. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, encouraging us to basically consider the uh, have this situation uh, and that's why I donated this bus station on that side of the road. And we talked to PVTA and to basically that we are in, you know, the, the, the study had shown that the trend is that, you know, people usually don't have, a, they are using the zip car, they are not, you know, have cars. And this is, in, this is a small one bedroom apartment. So that was the idea. That's why, you know, we uh, put the bus station to basically, that that was the idea, you know, contrary to what we have in the center of town, that there is no parking to begin with for those two giant buildings. Here we have a, a, a parking, and as Chris knows, you know, we went back and forth, and the idea was that, you know, it should be uh, accommodating. It should be okay. We thought about it, and uh, I think it would be okay. <clears throat> and also we increased, I believe, two feet. Uh, the driveways has been widened two feet extra so that, you know, it would create better, you know, uh, room for the truck. That's good the driveways too. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jack. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, with regard to the lease agreement, is it, is it something that would be uh, possible to where you're keep, uh, keeping track of the, the vehicles, say, you know, license plates or whatever, but um, you're extending the permission through the lease agreement to the tenant with regard to a car or, or two or none sort of thing, just so you know what you're, you're dealing with there. Exactly. And, but I don't know, I, I'm not, you know, uh, an expert on lease agreements, but no. I didn't see anything about vehicles no. in that. The, we would have that in the lease that you know the tenant would have a one a design, the one parking space, and uh, so the tenant would know if they they would be comfortable with that or not. So the type the tenant that you know would be leasing this place, would renting this place, would know that you know uh, if they are the type of people that you know they are going to be uh, having. More car, obviously, this is not a place for them. Yeah. Just uh, one question: What a, would it tell them if they have guests or overnight guests? No, no, guests, no. That you know, or? if you are going to have that, they are going to have one parking. 
So it's not like going to be like a Pofton village where there, you know, is unlimited. So that there is, you know, one parking space. And if they are comfortable with that, that would be, you know, so that it would be in the lease that, you know. Well, I'm they're... asking if they, where do you tell them where they can have guests? Mm -hmm. If they have someone come visit I them, where can they some, park? We have a few extra uh, parking. Well, there, there's five extra spaces, yes. not for, but you know, whether, how, how often they're going to be. Um, can used I just for the clarify and remind that four of them are handicapped, mm -hmm. so only handicapped people can park that. So just yes. take four off the, just when you're talking about that. Or, unless you have a lot of handicapped people moving in, they're not going to be really utilized, mm -hmm. and guests can't use them. No. But I, are you, I don't know <laughs> which one of you, I, I don't know. I, I would just want to bring up, uh, Chris sent an email that kind of addressed this, that, you know, maybe you should come up with a parking management plan. Um, she was saying, and if your management plan doesn't have a parking management plan, which would basically address everything that was brought up, which is, you know, car and van pooling, bicycling, public transit, um, just a documentation of how you're reducing vehicle trips or what the, you know, um, sort of projections and what the actual you know, utilization ends up being so that we can kind of know that you're you're managing this aspect because it is a concern. You're mm -hmm. you're definitely below what's required. So um, it's just something, yeah, just to uh, sort of um, sure. maybe include in your management plan. Um, uh, yeah. okay. And I just think to to this point that you raised, I agree that for a project that is this large, you need to figure somehow some sort of a visitor parking or guest parking because it's very difficult. Like I can imagine that some people might have a car and eventually also have a guest or a visitor. So I don't know how you're gonna pull that off, but maybe that means that some units don't have any parking spot, but I think you have, and I don't know exactly what the minimum number is, but I think that you need to factor in some guest or visitor parking, because otherwise it would be untenable. So, so my concern is that we can't waive the two car parking requirement um, without it meeting the criteria in the bylaw for a waiver. And so um, under S section 7.9, it talks about waiving the parking requirements. So you have to meet one of these exemptions. And so if there is a parking management plan, it has to be sufficient to reduce the need. And so I, I just don't know how with 62 units, you know, two people living there, they each need a car, they have, you know, a party, they have guests coming. Um, I don't know how you get, I mean, we're not living in New York City where you can just jump on a subway or take a bus everywhere. I don't know where a parking management plan is that people are gonna be carpooling to the same workplace and back. I, it has to be a realistic one, not just an idea. It is one. realistic because I, I hope Chris can uh, inject his, uh, the meeting that we had, we actually came to the planning board, we, uh, and somebody was suggesting that you know, forget about parking. You know, there was a gentleman that you know that, but uh, we did came. You know, we the reason we developed this building with the 62 units was because this is how we went back and forth with the town. That basically you know to make sure that how many uh, spaces we can have. And that's what we were told, that, you know, that's why we donated at the time when uh, this project goes to the time when the Southeast Street was being, you know, paved, you know, that's why we put the, the infrastructure, that's why I donated the land for the bus stop, and we, I talked to Jason, so we, this has been, it's not something that, you know, we just came with the 62 unit. The 62 unit were based on that projection and what we were told. Chris? Um, Mr. Mikchi did come to the planning board, and I think it was in June of 2018. Yeah. Um, the building, though, had fewer units in it at that time. I think it had 47, 47 units. 47, we and think, yeah. I don't remember what the distribution of bedrooms Bedroom, was, yeah. but, you know, there were fewer units in the building, so I just wanted to mention mm -hmm. that. Um, we do often talk to developers about um, trying to explain why they need fewer parking spaces, and I think Mr. Robleski last time gave you a pretty good 
rendition of why he needed fewer parking spaces. He had an example of a building that was right next door to where he was developing his new building, and he gave you um, numbers that showed that people in his existing building didn't all have cars. And so, and, and you've already heard from Ron Labertier with regard to that, that many of his tenants um, don't have cars or they only have one car. So um, I think the point is that you're looking for some hard information written down from Mr. McChee explaining exactly why it's appropriate for him to have fewer parking spaces here. And that would include there's bus service there. And he should talk about does the bus service serve the property all year long or is it just seasonal bus service? Um, he's got bi bicycle parking. Well, how many bicycle parking spaces does he have? And um, is he planning to provide any covered spaces so perhaps the bicycles could be used in the winter? Is there any uh, parking for bicycles inside? That's something that the developers in the downtown area have been providing, and um, that seems to be satisfying the needs of their tenants. Um, and, and that type of thing is, is going to be helpful for the planning board to understand. And you know, if he can do any kind of sort of survey of um, developments around town to find out how many people do have cars, how many people don't, I think UMass has some data that shows that many of their tenants don't have cars. But you, you want some hard information to help you to understand why 62 parking mm -hmm. spaces or 68 parking spaces is going to work here, not, not just kind of you know, off the top of someone's head. So I think it's, it's a question of writing it down, writing down the yes. parking management plan. And, um, and, I, and Ms. McGowan gave good guidelines because there is a section of the zoning bylaw that mm -hmm. kind of spells out what that parking management plan should be. I think, well said, Chris, and I think they're all trying to just say they want to see that you have thought this out. You're asking for half of the spaces that are required, so where are those, that half of cars or those people who are living there and how are they? So it could be, you know, supplemental lot. Like, how you're going to tell your tenants you can't just say there's no guest parking because they're going to go park somewhere else and then you're going to be blamed for cars that are parked in places they shouldn't be. No, the idea was that, you know, we were encouraged that that was the thing that, you know, they said that the trend is that, you know, people are not, don't have cars, they're using True. Uber and they're using, you know, mm -hmm. other things. So that is the, and that was the idea. That let is the idea. Okay. Do so let me just give you like an intention. Mm -hmm. So when I look at this building and I, again, we go to pedestrian, put our pedestrian hats on and we walk. If you're parked on the outer parts of this, how do you get in the building? Let's say you're parked in, the, in that, at like, uh, you know, nine o'clock in that strip. How are you, you get out of your car and how are you going into the building? Well, just um, if you take the clicker and just, so the far, the far western side of the parking lot, anywhere, yeah. right there, great. You're parked right there. How do you get, walk into the building? Show you me with go, the. You can go here. No, 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 but how did you get there? If the lot is full with cars, there's nowhere to walk on a sidewalk and enter your building. Look, there's no, you've got dumpsters, then you have curbing and you have a tree there. People shouldn't have to be walking through the mulch under a tree. If all those spots are full at seven o'clock at night, there's no way, how, how are they gonna walk in? So where you'd normally have a place, a drop off spot, you've got a bike rack, you've got a tree, which I assume doesn't just grow out of the sidewalk, it's talk, got a four. Talk about here? Nope, where your lobby is, where your main door into this establishment. No, not that one. That's where everyone, right there. Okay. So there's no drop off area. If you want to encourage share rides, say, right? These people are gonna be going out, they don't need a car, they're gonna take Uber, right? Where is the Uber dropping them off safely to get into the building? There's no drop off spot. And I know what the pinch has been. You've been trying to jam as many parking spots in as possible. But to the point, you've lost 
the, the cohesive flow of how people are even going to get into your building and there's a welcoming space. The only way to walk in is you've literally left the handicapped loading zone is your entrance to your building. That's not an entrance. And then your center where you do have a, a, a space, you have a bike rack jammed in there and trees and bushes. This is not a, a pedestrian friendly building. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like, yes, I do. And then but when you've got the first row at the top, they're all compact cars. I'll tell you, I got a lady handbag that's so big, I can't squeeze between two compact cars. So how are they going to get in? So you've sort of lost in this fight. I get it. We used to have 47 units. Now we have 62. But with that, you have 128 but, but, spots you're supposed to have. We don't see... No. No, a true intention of making it pedestrian going friendly. Going to 62, we, we went back and forth. It wasn't that, you know... I don't know who told you this, but it wasn't us. No, because, okay. But the idea was that, you know, uh, uh, how many parking space do the, those buildings have in the town? In <sighs> Apples and oranges. So th that's a good question. So <laughs> it's a no parking zone, and... As of May of this year, over 175 parking permits were asked for by people in those buildings. That wasn't even to June. And so, I mean, I, I like the idea of the no parking um, zone in, in sort of a fantasy, but it hasn't worked in Boston. It, it's not working downtown. But and so I, I, think, I think the thing is, is that I understand you've had conversations and things like that, but this building's gonna be here for 100 years and People, we're, you know, I, you know, maybe we hit a point in time where I could get on a bus and go to the Big Y and come back with my, you know, four bags, and it would be convenient. Or that people don't, you know, would somehow bike through a New England winter. But it's, it, you know, like this is, this isn't Manhattan. This is, you know, a, a village center in a town that is mostly people get around by cars. And so I think that, you know, as a member of the planning board, I'm looking at this building thinking. There's a lot of units and there's not enough parking and people aren't going to be able to, you know, they just, they won't have space to park. And then if they have guests or a party and 10 people come over, there's no, and you know, when Florence Banks said that, you know it's going to go into their parking lot, you know, and you know, that's just how humans behave. So I think that, you know, to me, there's just too many units and not enough parking. And so to, you know, if you added 20 extra units and then there's, you know, it's just not, I don't know how you're going to find find parking spaces when there just aren't enough. But the, um, these units were not you know, arbitrary. They were, we had the consultation. We went through this uh, and you know, we can reduce the number of the unit and increase the uh, size of the unit. That is, you know, we can do that. But it wasn't just arbitrary. It wasn't just, of course, you know, uh, there is uh, economics behind it. You know, as a mm -hmm. landlord, you know, I would like to have mm -hmm. more unit to basically make this cost benefit with a project that costs millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this number, this 62 unit, wasn't just arbitrary to just, you know, come up with 62 and jam it, you know, as much as possible. Even though that was, you know, we were trying to take, you know, advantage to be the most efficient as far as the land use was, is concerned. But we had consultation. But if that is, uh, if you think, and whatever works is in my benefit as well. So it is not, I don't take it as you, your comment as an adversarial you know, comment. I understand it. And, you know, we even, you know, I asked uh, Mike if it was possible to have more, uh, seven more parking space by the wall. And that was. By the, say that again. Well, on that by. curved portion of the yeah. driveway. Okay. And where is it? Yeah. But we were thinking about having no parking here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we were suggested that, no, let's not uh, do it. So, uh, but I wish that, you know, there was better communication from those people who we seek, you know, uh, the advisement. Uh, that, you know, we went through a lot of, and you know, every little ch changes mm -hmm. cost so much from it. <laughs> all anger. I wish there was you know, better you know, communication for next 
project because this is the phase one. I'm going to have the across the street, and I don't want to say, oh, I cross. And even I, in our meeting, uh, we had a two hours meeting here in that room that, you know, I talked to the building inspector and said, how about across the street that, you know, we would be having, you know, another development there and we would have a joint, you know, thing. And he said, no, let's concentrate on this, you know, on this side. And we would just, you know, concentrate the, to make sure the parking lot would be adequate. And we were told that, you know, uh, even though the bylaw is two to one, for each unit, one would be okay and planning would have no problem. That's why we came here. And if there was that, you know, better communicated to us, obviously I would have had it designed it that way. So, but um, we are not a stock, you know, it's not too late. We can do whatever is necessary to make it work. And if it basically means that, you know, to reduce the number of the unit and make the unit a little bit, you know, uh, bigger, so be it. That would be it, you know. But it wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't just, you know. We don't think that. Okay. And we hear you. And we understand the economics. And it's a balance. It's a compromise. You're trying to balance how big of a building you can build and yet meet all the requirements and be realistic about parking. And it's not arbitrary. But what we're saying is yes. you're cutting the parking in half and so what is being done to supplement or encourage or fix that way? So when you talk about downtown, one of those buildings has a zip car in it. They have parking, bike parking inside their building so that it's year round shelter. They have shared ride drop offs that are very clear and easy. So there are things that if you want sure. to have that reduced parking, you have to show in your drawing that that is sure. there. There is no drop-off area right now. You know, you're, it's not pedestrian friendly. So you need to go back and look at those things and write, I don't know, maybe a few, maybe the building does have to shrink a little, I don't know, but you have to try to work with your designers and see how you can show that you're addressing and encouraging your tenants to take alternative modes of transportation. Sure, people they definitely use those alternatives that you know are being used in the other building. But as I said, you know, I wish we were it was because we had not numerous but good number of you know back and forth. It, this was this plan, this building was developed by the consulting the, the town. So. It, but definitely we would come up with a better management plan and see whether it is a matter of uh, having a zip car there, having the inside uh, bike. Drop-off drop areas. Off, and, yeah. and just remember, four of the spots are handicapped, so it's kind yeah. of a loose area yeah. to cover. And realistically, you do have to put in some for guest spots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just we're just trying to play with reality here, too. Sure. We don't want this to end no, up no. being a problem then it's all of our problems. No, it's a very valid point. Yes. Uh, we, we have a couple of letters from Jason Skeel. It doesn't really speak to the parking, so I don't, you know, I understand we, we weren't a part of that, but I think the town is pretty helpful in terms of guidance, so um, I, but I don't, I don't see feedback from them speaking to your parking in any letters that we have or any communications. Uh, Jason doesn't deal with the parking. Uh, what ha uh, happened was that uh, in the course of uh, uh, developing this, uh, uh, we were told that you know, if we would have a bus stop, that basically would be convincing as a part of the parking uh, management. So that's why, you know, when they were building, when they were uh, paving uh, s southeast, Jason came to me and said, Amir, are you willing to donate the land? And that's what I donated the land across the street so that, you know, we would have that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I'm, I was saying that, you know, I think we could have a better guidance, you know. We hear we you be, and appreciate have a better that. Situation. Yeah. But for sure, we are here and I understand <laughs> that and that you are here to basically making sure that we have a building that is, is reviving, that doesn't, is not problematic, and uh, especially that you know, we will have another development across the street. 
So I appreciate your point, and I would definitely uh, try to address that. Chris? I think it's mainly a question of describing how it is you're going to manage your parking. Mm -hmm. If you are going to have 68 parking spaces and you think it's adequate, then how are you going to enforce? How are you going to make sure that um, only your tenants are parking here? How are you going to make sure that your tenants aren't parking on other people's property? Are you going to have parking placards? Are you going to have stickers? Right. Um, you need to connect your lease to your parking plan. Um, you need to describe to the planning board the fact that you are on a bus route, you are providing bicycle parking. So it's part of a narrative, and you may need some help. Perhaps um, Mr. Liu could um, enlist some people in his firm to put together a narrative about how you're going to manage your parking. It is possible to do this, and it mm -hmm. is probably possible to convince the planning board that you know what you're doing and you're going to follow through on it. But we have to have something in writing. It can't just all be conversation. And I would start with the, and then your next part. I would start with the redesign to fix some, you know, make it pedestrian friendly, drop off space, rethink maybe where you have the trees. Like, you know, start with that, and then you have to see if you can fit your 68 spots in there. And maybe you can. I mean, this is more than us. It's just we're asking for certain sure. things to be there. But um, so I'm, if you're coming back with a lighting plan, you're coming back with a landscaping plan, we would like to see a, a parking management plan. Um, and yeah, and then up. And so these are the expectations we have for coming back. And then I think Pari's next with a question, and then you're in the hopper. It's good. You said all the things that I wanted to say. Excellent. Discuss. OK. Just trying to get yeah. deliverables, yeah. but go so ahead. So I, I just, I just want to reiterate is that I just, you know, we have the bylaw. It has a requirement. It's based on, you know, we have six trips a day for each unit. It's because people use cars. And so, you know, I know your target audience is sort of millennials in their 20s, but people become 30 and they have children. And we don't know how this building's going to be used. And, you know, we don't know who your tenants are. We don't know who your t the tenants will be in 10 or 15 or 20 years. But we know if we don't have enough parking, that's going to be a problem that goes forward. And so, um, and we don't have a great bus system here. You know, it's like if everybody worked at UMass and got on the bus and came back. But most people I know who work at UMass, even down off of Route 9, drive in. And so I, I don't need just a plan. I need a realistic plan with sure. information that shows that people but don't, you know, a couple only has one car, you know, in the, this area. These buses would come uh, every 20 minutes. The same bus that goes through Colonial Village, that's the same bus route that basically comes every 20 minutes during the school Yeah. So just a note to make sure you check summer schedules too, yeah. because that yeah, same bus did. goes by my house and it yeah, could be an hour in the yeah. summer. Just no, no. this is what you have to have, no, we you know, research. I did it. talk to PVTA. This is you no, know, yeah, mm -hmm. yes. It is the same route. And they were very happy that, you know, they would have this extra stuff. Uh, Chris? I just wanted to make one more suggestion. It could be that some of these units don't have any parking, that mm -hmm. there's no parking attached to that particular unit, and that frees up parking spaces for guests or whatever else might be needed. So it could be that there are people out there who don't need parking spaces. I've seen evidence of that in other projects, yeah. and um, that may be a choice that Mr. McChee makes uh, with regard to some of these units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that sounds very reasonable because then in that case we could say we have let's say 60 parking, six, 60 units can have one parking and then we have X number of visitor, X number of handicap and then a much better layout for the parking lot. I think that makes more sense than trying to force and match each unit and s pretend that they have a parking but that the space is really untenable. Yes, <laughs> I appreciate that, and please, uh, uh, I really uh, appreciate your advice, you know, so <laughs> if I, uh, I hope I didn't get emotional, but <laughs> if I did, I didn't mean to <laughs> get upset, it was just, uh, so I appreciate your points, it's well taken, it's very valid, and sure, we try to look into it more. We were more busy with trying to get the three resolved and then you know get this done because it's 
to m not lose the winter. So, sure, now that I have more time, we would spend more time to come up with the okay. parking management to make sure it is uh, realistic and it is uh, trouble free. Sounds good. I just want to say, does the board have any more questions? I was going to open up to the public just in case they have any questions on this. Okay. Uh, does the public have any questions they'd like to ask on these? Okay. Looks good. So, uh, oh, there is one. Uh, so if you could, one of you can switch out, maybe Mike, one of, and then just, just say your name and yep. if you're an Amherst resident. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Kavanaugh. I'm with Florence Bank, actually the one who sent a letter in and spoke with uh, Chris a few weeks back. Uh, so thank you very much, number one, for, um, for addressing the parking issue or you know, working to, to address the parking issue. As you can see in the letter, there was three concerns we had. Um, again, the, the main thing to take away is like, we're actually very much in favor of this project, so that's not the issue. It's just a matter of you know, how we're going to design it so it doesn't have any, and we mitigate any impact it has on everybody around us. So the second question, or the, one of the other three items was the uh, setback that we're looking at between the, uh, north prop the north side of the building and the property line. It's, I believe it was five at one point, now it might be six and a half feet. I'm not exactly sure what's on the print right at the moment. Oh, it's five yeah, foot setback. I, on the, the sides, yeah. Um, the last time there was the testimony, it was six feet four inches or 6.4 feet or something like that on the um, north side. Right, so. I'm sorry. It is six feet on the north and five feet on the uh, street side. Sure. Yep. Is it five? Really? It's five on the street side. Thank you for. It's five on the street. I'm sorry. You misread that. I can verify, but right now we have we're showing six on both. That's what I think it is. Yeah, yeah. But not like six point four or something. I think no, they're this flat number. No, six point two yeah. before, and it was just because the building slightly Skewed changing the, by the a couple function. of inches in one direction, but we didn't we we didn't shift the building. For instance, it just you know stayed the same, but you know the the width or something. I think there was some minor changes of inches, you know. But right now we think six on yep. front, six on yep. north. I'm reading so. six, yep. Okay, thanks. So the concern was, um, I believe the setback is 10. Uh, and then I was just thinking logistically, how are they gonna actually build a three-story building six feet off a property line without, you know, just to put up a ladder or whatever, it goes out more than six feet. So since that urge you had, since that issue had not yet been addressed, I just wanted to, you know, make everyone aware that we're concerned how that's actually gonna happen. And they will have to submit a construction plan, and yep. some of that gets addressed in that. Um, and if, if you have any other questions, say them. It looks like the owner is willing to come back up and sure. answer some of that. Okay. So, um, real quick, those were the only two questions. The third comment was with regards to, you know, is the drainage, but uh, they responded that the town checks the drainage okay. out, or I think that's what the comment was, and um, or the response was. So, yeah. again, just wanted to, to reiterate, you know, we're 100% we're in favor of the project in and of itself. Just want to make sure it fits in uh, as best okay. as possible. And concerns about construction. And concerns so about those two things I brought to up. your property about, line you know, and the fence, which, because it's your fence. Right. You're, I'm not really worried about the fence. I mean, there's, there's only six feet to actually build a three-story building. I was just, in my mind, that seems extremely tight. But again, we're not in Manhattan, like somebody said. So you want to ask that? Okay. Do you, in terms of the setback, it's, it's six feet forever. Once the building goes in, would you like to see it at 10 feet going on, you know, just in terms of the use of your lot or building? Um, What's your primary, you know, is that another it, concern? No, it's just, it's the concern of the, however long the construction period is and the impact of all the equipment that's going to take to build a three-story building in a reasonably tight lot um, and not being able to do it within six feet. I mean, staging in and of itself is four feet. It doesn't actually touch the building when you put it up. So, you know, there's just certain dimensions that, you know, the average contractor may need to actually build a building that's that large. So just wanted to, just wanted to bring it up. That's all. No, I don't have any other concern about, you know, the fact that it's a three-story building overlooking our lot. It's a business. It doesn't really, it's not like I had a house, a single-story house. I might have a problem. But <laughs> yeah. that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
and Mr. Yeah. Michi. Uh, the general contractor for this project is uh, Solumi uh, Contract. And they were, they're putting something together to submit to the Florence Saving about how they want to stage and, you know, about the fans, about everything. So that's what, that's what they're doing. So that will be addressed as yes. the construction uh, plan yes, and yes. controls. Uh, yes. And just, you know, in, we're country living here, but in the city, it, they build 30-story buildings with an abutter right there. So it it's, can be done. They just have to know what they're doing. Yes. <laughs> Submitting everything. Great. Thanks. Any other public questions? Okay. Um, does the board have any more questions? And Chris, did we forget anything? So there's going to be a lighting plan and a landscaping plan and a parking plan, a parking management plan. Um, oh, and you're going to look into the glass, some of the architectural issues of that first floor. Um, I did. Uh, yeah. um, oh, just about the um, in the town right of way, there needs to be town and owner language about defining the maintenance and repair of that area. But Jason wanted. He said they are. They have so much in their head. So I accepted so to. <laughs> Take care of it. And I think we need to do it. Well, I don't know. If, are you looking for a written document? Or well, sort of it might come from the town, but it would have to be agreed upon with yeah. you, especially if this is a condition, right, Chris? De defining, you know, what is maintenance of this public space and what that would include and delineation of the area and then also repair. I mean, you have a lovely patio or street furniture. That has to sort of be ironed out who replacement or how long or if there's a pothole in the patio who's got to fix it right yeah um so does yeah Chris. so i think um there's a a list of conditions possible conditions floating around i think the planning board has a copy and perhaps um we should give copies to you all if you don't have them already um and one of the conditions is that um the applicant would be expected to maintain that right of way um, from the curb line back to his property line. And it would be the, the expectation that that would be um, part of the, the work of the applicant through the life of the building. So whether it's Mr. Okay. McChee or whether it's a new owner, um, they would be responsible until that building is no longer there and something else goes in. And then we'll figure it out in the future. Um, this project uh, for the work in the town right of way is going to go before the town council. The town council will have to approve it, and so yeah. they, I'm sure, will be putting some um, language on when they grant Mr. McChee the ability to do the work, um, saying, you know, how are you going to maintain it? And um, we've suggested that he come up with a, a maintenance plan. Actually, that was a suggestion of the town engineer, and I think it was in the town engineer's most recent letter. Um, that uh, he would like to have a maintenance plan in writing um, describing how that property is going to be maintained. So there's another one. Uh, and I, I think that's all you have to bring to us to now. There'll be other things when you want to get your building permit that will be due, but. Do we want to see a new lease agreement with parking in it? But that would yeah. be part of the parking management anyway. It could be. They're tied together, right? But that would put the verbiage of how you're actually communicating sure. to mm -hmm. your tenants. Okay. Anything else that we're adding on this list? Janet? Um, this is also from a public comment made this summer about the lack of recreational space, and that's one of the requirements for the special permit, there be adequate recreational space. And so um, because the building is big and takes up a lot, and there's, you know, I just kept on looking at that strip of land thinking, is that enough, you know, for people to put some chairs out or barbecue and, you know, 60, maybe 90 people living there, it seems kind of a tight fit. And I just wanted to just, it's been on my mind. 
I know there's that public space up front. I just find it really hard to imagine that people are going to hang out there. I mean, if it's a coffee shop, yeah, but what if it's not? Or, you know, I don't know if people are going to say, oh, invite their friends over and hang out on Southeast Street. I just, it's hard for me to see. And so I wondered, is there some way of getting more space or making it more, you know, bigger and a little more something, you know? Again, when you're reconfiguring yeah. and I mean, looking no, at that backyard area. Yeah, North Square had some spots put together, you know. Uh, that's one of my concerns. There was uh, something that, uh, while ago in one of the meeting, uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, uh, that you asked that you know, I could, we could ask for the zero setback for this, the street front. Yeah, I don't know. Was it one of the? Not the bank side, you but the uh, the line. front side, hear. on the street side, that we could have zero setback or less than five feet setback. Am I right? Chris? Initially, um, when Mr. McChee came and spoke with us, he was proposing a zero setback in the front. And then he pulled the building back. So that would be up to his, him and his designer to decide what they want to ask for. What meaning? And, yeah. Because so would there be 30 feet in front and not 35? Is that right? If you had no, no, zero no. setback? Not going to the drive uh, right away. Basically, there is a six feet from the, the from borderline. And if you make it you know, to zero, basically, we are going to have more land yeah. for the parking and more mm -hmm. land for the, so that's what I mean. Are you open to that? Would you still have the landscaping in front of the building? Yes, of course. Are we, sorry. Right now the front of the building gets pushed yeah. back six. They're saying, what if they bring it back up to the, to the property line? That gives them another six feet in the back yeah. to play yeah. with to, as you're reconsidering. Yeah. I, I, Chris, I, I, don't, I wasn't part of these beginning discussions they had. I mean, to me, whether it's zero or six, I, was there a town right of way issue with this or? I think, um, no, there wasn't a town right of way issue. I think what we would be concerned about is that they are able to build the building on their property. And then we don't want any of their building, the footings or anything mm -hmm. in the town right of way. And we want the building to be completely contained on the private oh, property. And if they can do that right. with the zero setback, that's mm -hmm. probably Next. okay. And I also think that for a building of this size, having zero setback and immediately starting at the property line. Say that again, Pari, a little louder. I, I just think that maybe for a building of that size, to have it at zero setback and have it immediately next to the road might become like almost too much. So I don't know, um, I mean, maybe there's a middle ground to be reached, but I just feel that a zero setback visually and in terms of the presence of the building on the street is just I just may I just say something yeah. I think there's a little confusion here about what the zero setback means and the property line just for those of you who haven't participated in the previous discussions the property line is actually set back a fair distance from the edge of the road and perhaps yeah. Mr. Um, Lou could show on this plan where the actual property is, line yeah. is yeah. Um, and note the fact that the town actually owns that whole area in front of the building. Between the front of the building and the street, the town owns that. And Mr. McChee is proposing to build within that area. And so now he's talking about just lessening the, the setback um, from where his building now is, moving it six <coughs> feet closer to the street rather than m moving it right up to the edge of the sidewalk. Does that make sense? So I think you just have to consider, I don't know, maybe it does have to be a foot back or something. I remember sure. with Spring Street, they had, you know, if you have an overhang over your lobby door, yeah. they had, oops, you know, or um, any of these architectural, like, window sills or whatever. I don't, you know, it all, like what no, it, Chris was saying, it all has to be on your property. No. I'm aware of the condition that the footing should not be on the right yeah. of way. Yeah. So we have that, you know, that's why we put six. But I'm asking that, you know, if we could make something better, are you, is it okay if we make the setback? Having the no intrusion to the right of way, 
and having the hang of you know the, right. any of these you know right on my property if you are going to be open to that that's what i mean so we would look into it i think so yes. I mean, yeah i okay thank you so much so when do you think um next i just wanted to note that back, the yeah. awnings over the retail space yes. should be on the private property also yeah yeah so door openings and such i mean we have that downtown because we have buildings right on the zero so there is some in, yeah um so when could they come back or how much time do you need mr michi this the next meeting would be october 2nd yes, would be please. your your choice <laughs> Yes. No, okay. You don't want to do the overtime, Mike. <laughs> that would be fine. I can f talk to Peter and see if he can do something so else. But October 2nd, please. All right. We will set it for October 2nd, but let us or let Chris Bestrup know if this is not going to work and sure. you need the 16th, and we'll reschedule you for that. All right. So at this point, um, I would need a motion of someone saying we're continuing this public hearing to October 2nd. Yeah. My first motion. I'd like to make a motion to continue this hearing to October 2nd at 7.05. Is that good? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. Excellent. All right. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. And that's unanimous. So hopefully we'll see you on the 2nd. If not, we'll see you on the 16th. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for all the comments. So we should hold on to all this paperwork again. <laughs> May I ask uh, Mr. Liu to make sure that we get the latest lighting plan and yep. um, all we that. did the, the, the next the, iteration the, with yeah. the reiterate yeah yeah landscaping lighting and yeah and the parking and part yeah lease and that's a homework okay great. So people are. Are you here for something specific? I just want to make sure you don't get forgotten. Great, welcome. <laughs> All right, so we will move now to item four planning and zoning. Item A, zoning, zoning subcommittee report. Uh, Y'all, you got, uh, didn't meet, but are we, are there any discussion about what's happening with that since we've lost a member? And I think that the zoning subcommittee needs a new member, um, and we'll probably look to the board members to volunteer to be on the zoning subcommittee. Um, looks like Ms. McGowan is raising her hand. That would be great. At the same time, is the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust also empty? We have vacant on our list on the back. I was just wondering as, if we were. Yes, and I, I, I should check on that. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Just making yeah. sure that yeah. great if we fill the slot. Want to just so um, great, Janet. So you'd be up for joining the zoning subcommittee. Yes. Okay. That would be great. And yes, when you get around to um, the last, well, no, to the re reorganization, the next item on your agenda, mm -hmm. then you would um, nominate mm -hmm. and elect Janet to be on that oh, subcommittee, okay. right? Yep. Item five, I guess. And when's the next time they'll probably meet? Will that be October 2nd? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no public comment. So let's move to item five, election of officers and planning board reorganization. So I, 
which do we start from? Do we start at chair and move to clerk or? Okay. So someone want to be chair? <laughs> I nominate Christine Gray Mullen uh, to be the chair. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do I have to vote? <laughs> oh, okay. So, oh yeah, I have to say that. Okay, so um, any discussion? Oh, there's no discussion. Any, um, so all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, unanimous. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now, to join the fun, we need a vice chair, someone to replace me, and I would like to nominate um, Jack Jemsick. Ruby? <laughs> you guys have to vote. But... All right, does someone want to say second? <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> all right, raise your hand, all in favor, say yeah, wave your hand. We have unanimous, great. And um, to complete the trifecta, we need a clerk. Gee, hmm, Maria, <laughs> would you be up for? Being the clerk? Oh, nice. Does someone want to second my suggestion? Second. Oh, look at everybody right, wants second. to second. <laughs> um, any discussion? I, everybody. <laughs> I just saw a hand shoot up. Um, so all in favor, raise your hand. And again, unanimous. So we also need to have our new member voted in on the zoning subcommittee. So um, well, I'll nominate Janet McGowan to be on the zoning subcommittee, um, which she accepts. And second by Jack. Any discussion? No. All in favor, please. Hands up. Great. Unanimous. Wow, that was fairly painless. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Fun together. <laughs> All right. May I just um, <laughs> note that you did um, previously nominate and elect Jack to be the representative oh. to Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Didn't we already? And then you did have a vote on that. Oh, yeah. And then you nominated Christine Gray Mullen to be the alternative. But I don't know if anybody ever followed through on that. Did the town council ever get in touch with you and say that you actually are the alternate we member? voted, but is it a town manager thing? Or Maybe a it's a town manager thing. I think it was thing. the town manager. And so did he I actually never give you any paperwork? So we need to follow up on that. Because Piner Valley Planning Commission, their attitude is we are the members until they hear differently. Yes. So right. we're just sort of continuing. But if the town wants to make it official, then yes, the town manager needs to do something. So I think the town manager's on a roll now, and he's getting into his <laughs> appointments. So I'm going to follow up on that with him. Okay. Um, and Michael Burtwistle, are you going to, we've already agreed that he w would like to be the Community Preservation Act Committee person. Do you want oh, right. to re-nominate him for that and elect him? Just run through the whole roster of things that you normally do oh, and make okay. sure that you've got everybody all set. Okay. So should we, should I nominate Michael as the CPAC person and then anyone want to second that? Pari, thank you. Um, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, hands up. Uh, that looks unanimous. Uh, and Agricultural Commission, Pari, so we re do we need to redo these? Yeah. You don't need to renominate Pari. You already Good. nominated her in December, and I've oh, okay. forwarded that information to the town manager. I think he's planning to act on that soon because okay. he just contacted um, are you me still about it. waiting? Can I just tell you? <laughs> Because Mr. Zomik was, I, I actually attended an Act Commission meeting in July, and Mr. Zomik said that he didn't think that I needed any form of approval. So he said to check back with you, anyhow. Back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it both ways. Okay. And today Yikes. the town manager asked me about who was the AgCom yeah. rep. So I told him you had been nominated. Yes, and I've already attended meetings. <laughs> Them, you have attended meetings, and I'm Who's hoping that first? he will do something. <laughs> I, but we don't need to do anything right now, Carl. No, Good. And Design Review Board, is Michael up to? Okay. Sure. So I'll nominate Michael for Design Review Board. Pari seconds. Any discussion? 
Okay. All in favor? Five, unanimous. Okay. Um, so the Amherst Municipal for Housing Trust. This was Greg. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't really know what they do. So I, I think I've gotten them confused with the different housing committees. So that They've taken over from all the previous housing committees, including yeah. housing and sheltering and all the other committees that have been um, there in the past. And they handle really all of the issues related to housing that the town gets involved in. Is John Hornick the chair? Mm -hmm. John Hornick is the chair. So I'm just looking at the list here. So not trying to put extra pressure on certain people, but I do see some people's names on there twice. Um, if no one's bought, do you want to do it? I'm interested in that. Is it like one meeting a month? I don't know. How many meetings a month? I don't them? know. I can yeah. find out. Why don't you can put it we off till next time. Collect a little information and then on the next yeah. one, well, okay, because we usually I'm, I'm do a have. Bit, that. I'm a little yeah. bit interested by. It. Oh, okay. There's a bandwidth issue for me. And we could um, have two people. I yeah. mean, you know, if you both yeah. want to go. So, why don't we get the information of when they're meeting or yeah. whatever, and then and actually, I'll even ask Greg what it entailed. Yeah. And then the next meeting, we can we can move on that. Is that all right, Chris? Because, all right. Zoning subcommittee, we now have three members, which is fantastic, and I will try to attend um, more often. And downtown parking working group, um, I don't think you need to. We're hoping, we're trying to die, but you know, it's been a long, <laughs> ugly death. Um, and there'll be a new parking committee, hopefully, that will rise from the ashes. I just want to say that. All right, so now we'll go. <laughs> Uh, so we'll go to um, agenda item six now, old business. Uh, item A is signing of decision. This is um, 462 Main Street, LLC, Center East Commons, which we did. Was that the last meeting? It's all a blur. But you just sent that out today, right? The yes, I sent it out this afternoon, and you may not have had a chance to read it. So you might want to take a chance to read it and then sign it on October 2nd. Mm -hmm. Could we do that? Because yeah. also Michael and David will be there. Yes, that's right. And they um, still need to sign it anyway. Yeah. Putting you, you or Pam, could one of you send it out yep. maybe again with a reminder to everyone to read it that it will be voted on on the 2nd? Uh, yes, Jack. Um, can you remind me what, because <laughs> on this theme of parking, <laughs> what, what, how, what, how many spaces did we yeah, approve? And 32 parking spaces. And how many units? And there are 16 units. 16 units. And they have office space as well as residential. <laughs> but they, they contend uh, two things. One is that um, not all of their tenants will have cars, which is true of their building that's right behind. And the other one is that the office, the office space and the residential won't be using the parking at the same time. So that they ha they're going to have seven or eight offices, I think, seven in the existing building and one in the new building. And those people will be there, you know, nine to five, and the residential will be there in the evening, and probably many of them will also be there during the day. But they feel like 32 is adequate. But that was 32 spaces for 16 units, but do you remember how many bedrooms there were? Because that's really where you, you know, because meaning just to compare to, um, Southeast Street Commons, they're all one bedroom, where, right? No, uh, it's oh, yeah. um, for dwelling units, it's based on um, parking spaces per unit, okay. but for offices, it is based on square footage. Okay. Yeah. But to get a good idea of parking demand, you have to, you should look at the building, yeah. right? So it's just to keep it to apples to apples a little bit. I was wondering how many bedrooms were in the southeast. So I don't have the total here, the main but I can give you the numbers. There are four one-bedroom oh, units, one ten two-bedroom units, okay, and two three-bedroom units. So I don't know what that adds two, up to. Two three-bedroom. So that's six, twenty, and four. That's thirty. Thirty bedrooms. So just. Interesting. So okay. I felt that yeah. the exemption that said, you know, if you have, you know, empty spaces and, you know, at different times of the day, that 
took care of it under the waiver provision. So you, know, you have to figure out where in the bylaw it fits. So it seemed to me that worked out really well. Explain again. That so the, you know, the, re know the requirement is um, two parking spaces per unit. And so he had 16, and so he had 32 parking spaces, right? And then there were seven other parking spaces that would be used during the day. And I was just assuming that people are going to be out and about on their six trips per person or whatever. <laughs> and so that made sense that it fit that exemption. Yes. Right. But if, you, if the idea is like, well, I don't think everyone's going to have a car, that's not in the bylaw. And so I think that, you know, there's, I mean, there's some people who might have more than, you know, they might have three cars and stuff like that. So. Um, and if you had three bedrooms and, you know, one teenager, you could have seven cars, you know, or, you know, whatever. So I think we have to, when doing the, the waiver, we have to look at the bylaw and say, does it fit? And I think that's what we've been doing, and that's why we've been making so many exceptions. Because we also look at the trends of, of what's happening. Um, and we look at other buildings. And, and like we said, with the Main Street, he had a building right next door, so he had fresh data that he's been tracking for years on, you know, how the parking is decreasing over the 10 years and, and use. So it's, right, there is no set number, right? You know, like what he, Mr. Michi was saying, you know, is, oh, but there was this number, you know, it's not just arbitrary, but in a way it is a little arbitrary because there's lots of factors we have to consider and it isn't always, if we go back to how, I mean, this bylaw for two spots for, two cars for every dwelling, I mean, that's a, it's a really old bylaw and it probably does need to be re-looked at. Mm -hmm. But is it a 50% cut? I don't know. You know, and this is where we, we're, we're trying to sort per of cut Perhaps that could be a task for the zoning subcommittee because I think that um, we have to follow the bylaw and follow the exemptions it allows us or the waivers. But if the trend is a way from, you know, people don't need two cars per unit, then, you know, we could look at the data on that and maybe suggest that as a change for the town council. Exactly. You know, I mean, you might find it not true, you know. <laughs> oh, that's, add this, it to the zoning subcommittee this list. This might be a good <laughs> zoning subcommittee <laughs> study, yeah. actually. I agree. I definitely agree. <laughs> um, so we'll sign that on the second. Uh, we already... Did, so we're all done with B, right? Apple, Brook, that's all good. That came back to you, right? Did we sign? Okay. Um, uh, uh, we have item C here, which is downtown planning. Um, brief discussion. Um, I know, I don't. has the town or the planning department been, I know they've been rolling around some different ideas of, you know, I, I hear all kinds of things. Recently, we haven't done anything with downtown planning, okay. um, and someone, I, maybe it was Janet or maybe it was Ms. Graymullen, Ms. McGowan or Ms. Graymullen, <laughs> asked me to put together notes on our last um, downtown planning forum, which was December of 2017, I think. Anyway, I haven't done that yet, but that's something that I okay. plan to do. Um, and I think that we do have $40,000 to get going with some sort of planning effort in the downtown. It's just a question of someone deciding, yes, we're going to do this. Yes, this is the right time to do it. Yes, let's go ahead. So is this something that you want to pursue, or is it something that you want to wait for a while? How do you feel about it? Maybe the zoning subcommittee could meet once or twice. I know they started on prioritizations, and it was a pretty big chart. We should probably revisit that. I don't know if you've seen that. This is, mm -hmm. and um, I, you know, I'm hearing things about you know master planning and and some of the town council's wants to look at with zoning. And I think it's really important to be looking at the downtown zoning, but we also have to prioritize and figure out what are we, what what directions are we moving in in the next year or two. I don't know. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah. With the zoning subcommittee, we put together that chart to kind of throw the ball into the town council's court, yeah. and we we're kind of waiting to hear back where they're prioritizing. So, um, I, yeah, we haven't done anything beyond putting together that list. Did that get sent to town council, Chris? 
It hasn't really been sent to town council yet, okay. although town council members have attended the zoning subcommittee mm -hmm. meetings and have copies of this. I've been attending the community resources committee meetings mm -hmm. of the town council and going over the master plan with them kind of line by line and explaining, you know, what we've done and what we haven't done. And Ms. McGowan's attended some of those meetings. Um, so they're getting into that and I'm not sure um, how big their appetite is for, you know, jumping into a big planning effort right now. So that's something that I'm trying to get a sense of. And, uh, I think that's critical because before we put our time into something, even if we think it's important, we have to make sure that it's going to be received and timely for what they're thinking this year. Yeah. The other thing is that the, um, who is it? It's the Amherst Municipal Housing, Affordable Housing Trust, uh, has hired a consultant with some money that they've received from the state to look at 40R districts, yeah. and so they are focusing on the downtown um, with regard to 40R and have a pretty expansive area that they're thinking of putting, a, uh, asking to have a 40R district overlaying on. And so that will affect downtown zoning and potentially affect what kinds of developments might come into the downtown. And there's a um, another forum on that that's going to be scheduled probably for early October at this point. But um, so that's coming up fairly soon. And maybe when we see what comes out of that, and that's actually going to be presented to town council to make a change in the zoning bylaw. That would, of course, come to the planning board for their recommendation before it goes to town council. But so that's something that's kind of in the, in the works that's pretty far along. So if that is in the works, I know I know next to nothing about 40R. Yeah. And I don't know about the rest of you all, but uh, could we have some training or pointed even to a video about 40R? Or should we go to this meeting? But I mean, if we're going to be asked to weigh in on it, I think we need to know what it means or where it's being used in other places and such. Yeah, Chris. I can send you um, links to some of the materials that have been circulated so far and that have been presented at previous 4DR meetings. There have been two meetings so far. I think there was one last spring and one early this summer. Um, but those have um, slideshows, PowerPoints, that okay. explain a lot of this business about 4DR and why it would be beneficial for Amherst. So I'll send those out to you Great. and you can have a look at them. Were those meetings videotaped? Sorry, I see you. No. So, and who's no. holding those? Like, if I was to try to find them, like, who's... Amherst is, Municipal Housing Trust. It They're is. The it's one of their... The, in okay. the forefront of this. They're the ones who actually got the uh, technical assistance grant from the state. Thank you. Janet? Um, in the downtown planning meetings, I went to the second one, which was about, like, what do you want to see downtown? And what was the first one about? The first one was general information about what would you like to have happen downtown yeah, or yeah. what's wrong with our downtown. It was actually a really good discussion. I think there were maybe almost 100 people there. That was a really big And it was showing. in the Jones Library yeah. and people really got engaged. And, and there's a lot of material on that, a on the planning. Engaged. A little too engaged. Oh, that was the second one. No, the second one that was the Bang Center yeah. one that was. Oh, um, that was the second one. That, I thought that, that, was that started that was, with a bang. Was oh. not fun. But it, it, I thought that I think when there was small groups, a lot of good information was. Yeah, that was good. Mm. So, um, so that information is the information about the first one is online. The information about the second one, no, not yet. Because I, I remember at the end of that meeting, I was thinking that maybe the third forum or third a third forum could be just on the look of buildings because that is a very hot issue and I've always thought people it's not as critical in a way what goes on in a building to people as how it looks and so that seems like a hot issue maybe people could do that talk about that and then kind of I think a question about who who do you want to live downtown because I think there's a fear that it's just going to become filled with students and you know so we'll have like you know sort of elderly people, you know, in and Whaling, you know, surrounded by students. And so maybe that's like, what kind of mix do we want to have? Do we want to have condos downtown, more of that kind of thing? But people are super engaged in that. And I think, I'm sure people would really come to a thing. And, and I, I sort of fear waiting for the town council, because I think they're actually, from the CRC meetings, looking to the planning board for some direction too, because they're getting their feet wet. And 
I think we're supposed to be revising the master plan as a planning board the next year or so. So, so I hear what you're saying on what people want, but what I would want, because we have to keep it to what the planning board can do and their jurisdiction, so it's more about, I think, at first, what can we build? Part of the problem is we're limited by our, our, the existing zoning we have, whether it be the BL or um, we don't have form-based code. We, you know, so like look and feel, we have no controls over, which is, the, you know, and who lives there? Well, I don't know if we ever have control over that, but maybe part of the form can be with the existing zoning we have now, these are the options we can build. If you changed this or this or this, these are other options that you can have. Like you said, condos, that would be great, but it's nobody can really build condos right now downtown, so that's why it doesn't happen. So it's great for people to want things, and we want to hear that, but then we have to, as the planning board, realize and, and tell them, like, we hear you, but you can't build that right now, but this is what we would have to do, because maybe that jump starts the conversations to get people realizing, oh, you do have to change the BL in this way to get that. Go yeah, ahead, I, I think from, from history, we were presented uh, in, in a pretty uh, detailed <laughs> manner how you cannot build. You, you, if there, if there were uh, an empty lot in the BL district, you would not be able to construct a building mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, meet the bylaw requirements. Because so it, it, pardon me? With residential use. Right, with residential use. We can build, that's why the Halleck building is, is there. Well, the Halleck building combined two lots to make it happen. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that John Kuhn mentioned that. But it doesn't have residential in it. So the question is yeah. number of dwelling units per acre or lot area mm -hmm. required per dwelling unit. That's what really is screwed up about the BL district. Because you can't really even build you know, one dwelling unit on that lot that um, on Halleck Street. Right. Never mind condos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a limitation. <sighs> so it sounds like, so we'll hear more from you and it, we're, and the zoning subcommittee, I think that can be a good discussion to sort of regroup on, on what needs to be done, which is massive. Um, D topics not anticipated in 48 hours. Do we have any of those? Oh, Jack. I, I just, uh -oh. <laughs> I'm scared. I know I am too. But I, I just have this issue rattling around in my head <laughs> with the town and where we're going in terms of uh, sustainability, mm -hmm. where we have the four large municipal projects on the table. And the only way to pay for them is from our tax revenue, which is uh, based on our residents. And I, I'm hearing so many people grumbling about moving out of town if the taxes go up, and we're already really high. So I'm wondering, from a zoning perspective, is there something that we're missing in terms of uh, looking at a commercial industrial area? You know, I want to make sure we're not missing out on on a business friendly type thing other than this mixed use you know uh, we project do. that we see you know quite often but I, I I think we should keep our eye on the the potential to develop a, a zoning where we're facilitating a commercial industrial uh, area within town, which we really don't have. I guess yeah. University we, Drive we used to be few. there. But Chris, could we have a map for the next meeting on just showing where the industrial commercial zones are left in town? And that's, that would probably be the first step. And then, and we can look at those, because there's not that many of them, and sort of take inventory, and then, I don't know, if you have any input, then you could add on areas that maybe could be, or, yeah. So we do have PRP. We have yeah, Professional Research yeah. Park, and a lot of the PRP has been used to date for housing. Um, Green Leaves is yes. a prime example. And yeah. now we're having Aspen Heights coming along, yep. and Aspen Heights is going to take up some PRP land. The PRP land we have on Belchertown Road is primarily wetland. 
and it's, so it's hard to find enough yeah. land to actually build something on. I think Ron Laverdier has some property on Larkspur Drive that could be built on. And then we have PRP in North Amherst, yes. and some of it is not served by sewer and water. So although someone might but, want to build right. something there, yeah. they or the town are going to have to put in the infrastructure to make it possible for someone to build something there. So we could have a discussion about those things as well as yes. the commercial and industrially zoned properties, and, and it might be revealing. Um, but I do want to say two things, I guess. One is that the residential development that we're seeing now is actually producing a lot of taxes in terms of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and two is we haven't seen the benefit yet of our marijuana. <laughs> so, you know, we have a very, yeah. s we have some in North Amherst. We're going to have two or three more on in University Drive. So they may produce some income that will alleviate some of our taxes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to mention those things. Yeah, um, I'd be interested in talking about that, especially like what kind of commercial biz and businesses and industry and like how big can it, does it need to be? And we do have commercial districts. That, are you thinking about larger kind of businesses? So it, that'd be a good discussion to have, you know. I think we can use a lot more flexibility in our zoning areas too. Like uh, the incubator, uh, what's that thing called? Yeah, that's going in up the, or if it does. Um, in North Amherst, is that PRP or no? that is PRP? Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's being discussed in an area that is um, north of the center of downtown North Amherst the Village. <laughs> yeah, particular development wouldn't, but that kind of business could go into. Um, it's probably more apt to go into the profession to the research and development. Mm -hmm. um, zone on the west side of University Drive. And, you know, we'd have to look at the uses, but some of the uses won't fit into the commercial district because they're more suited to, you know, restaurants and shops and hairdressers and things like, like that. So if you add the PRP and the commercial, if we could have some kind of, from the GIS, that would be great. Yeah, Jack? Um, and just, I'm just curious, the situation where UMass is gonna redevelop the apartment, the two apartment complexes on the north end of, of campus. That's just out of our purview because it's yes. the university owned land. Though it might um, be a P3, which I don't know what that does then, but it's their land, but it might be with a private um, investment. That's why it's a P3. But it hasn't even gone out for RFP yet. It does sound like that's getting closer, but I, I, I don't think there's a whole lot on it yet. Yeah, Janet was just wondering, does that part of the campus pay taxes? Whereas, if it's if it's run by if it's run by the for profit, that is a question, and we are exploring that. Um, we've gotten some indication that if something is run by a yeah. private entity that yes. it could be taxable, but it's not clear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've asked our town council that a couple of times. He's got experience in Cambridge where, you know, Harvard has a lot of property there and they have some public-private things going on and it's hard to um, to assess them for taxes. So it's, it's an open question, but it's certainly something that's worth pursuing. You know, um, speaking of universities, um, Harvard and MIT, they pay payments in lieu of taxes to Cambridge, and so I know I wonder about that. You know, are those discussions ongoing, or we do have payment in lieu of taxes yes, we do. from Amherst College and UMass, and I'm not sure about Hampshire College. Um, how, how much? How much is it? Well. I don't know what the numbers are. And there's different. There's water. There's lots of overlay areas, but just remember, like Harvard and MIT, they're private, just like Amherst, so they would have more ability than, say, a state university well, that UMass is legislation. Lowell, UMass Lowell is paying a million dollars to Lowell, so, and I think that's smaller than UMass Amherst. So I, th I think that's an interesting idea. And the university does pay, and uh, they pay for water, they pay for sewer, they, they pay for a lot of things. Uh, but you'd have to get exact numbers. But uh, yeah, I, it, you know, yeah. right, I'm sure that's 
always being. In fact, the town is working on their uh, not strategic uh, agreement strategic with the strategic it's partnership with being redeveloped. It, it, every few years you have to redo it, and I know they're act working on that right now. So that would be higher powers or re-examining the relationship. Yes. I understand there uh, was a breakfast recently, which I did not attend, a community breakfast with UMass, and um, Chancellor Subswamy spoke a lot about the things that UMass does for the town and the amounts mm -hmm. of money that, that UMass pays to the town for various things. So if you have a friend or someone who <laughs> might have gone to that breakfast, you could talk to them about what they gleaned from that. I unfortunately wasn't able to go, but um, it's, uh, I mean, Worth, worth finding that out. Mm -hmm. And just less, I think with the P3s, it depends on the use. Like if they had restaurants in there, that'd probably be restaurant tax. If it's a conference center, well, the town maybe could have conference center fees, like, you know, when you pay all the. So I think they're not even at that point, so it will depend on the usage. But there's no tax, I don't think, of the building itself, because that's the whole point. It's on university land. So, there's so much about to happen. All right, so we'll get, we'll continue Jack's comment with uh, investigating the industrial, commercial, and PRP. Okay, so uh, I'm hoping you'll say no, but for new business, A, um, anything, 48 hours, no? Okay, good. Uh, section 8, Form A, ANR, subdivision applications. We have one Form A, and I'll show it to okay. you. It's so. Property on Ball Lane, you're probably familiar ah, with it. It's actually, yeah, yeah. this particular property is between Ball Lane and Pulpit Hill Road. Um, but someone is finally wanting to um, develop a piece of property there and potentially build a house. So Pam created this wonderful map here, which shows <laughs> the property um, between Ball Lane and Pulpit Hill Road. On the far northeast corner is where um, someone wants to carve out a piece of property, and I'll come around with the A and R plan and show you that. But meanwhile, you can pass this map around. So this is the property that's been for sale for a long time. Did it finally get broken up? And are you saying one of the lots got sold? Or? They haven't completely broken it up. They've just carved out this one property just one. for okay. one house. So my Senses they may continue to do this, carve off frontage lots, potentially eventually carve off a flag lot or two, um, but they're going at this piecemeal right now. What's the recreation area? Nice spot. Yeah. And it's just enough for the building circle, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So do you authorize the chair to sign plans? Here's the plans. The essential question is, does this require subdivision control? And the answer is no, because there's no roadway being created. It's just a single right. road that's being created as a furniture line. Okay. Great. Uh, Number nine, upcoming ZBA applications. Anything, Pam? Great, thanks. Uh, Ten, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUBs applications. We have one that we just received. It's um, Amherst College, which is preparing to redo some of its uh, fields along North, uh, Northampton Road. Um, there's one particular field that they're really going to upgrade into a, a tournament level soccer, soccer field? Soccer field. I think that's right. Anyway, we just received the package today and we haven't completely reviewed it, but you'll be seeing that probably October 16th. Is this around the stadium area? Where the... It's just, um, 
sort of opposite Blue Hills and Dana it Street. It is that area. Right okay. there, that area, yeah. Okay. Uh, so 11, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. We'll just uh, PVPC, Jack. Uh, the next meeting is October 10th, a Thursday. And I, um, I, I don't know about the new director, whether yeah, she's officially on board as of yet, yeah, because yeah, Tim Brennan's yeah. signature was on this last email. So I'm on. I don't think they've made an announcement, so. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, CPAC, Michael's not here. Um, Ag Commission. Yeah, so I attended a meeting in July, and the meeting for September um, got canceled because there was not a quorum, so the next one will be in October. Thank you. Design Review Board, Michael's not here. Um, don't have the Housing Trust uh, Zoning Subcommittee. They'll meet the next meeting um, on the second. Uh, downtown Parking Working Group. The consultant is in final draft of their recommendations and implementation, and they'll actually be coming to the town council on Monday to present the draft final plan to um, sort of, uh, you know, start the education process with the town council and also hear questions from the town council, you know, to hear what they're thinking. So, and that should be done uh, in the next month. The final report should come out. Uh, Number 12, report of the chair. Yikes, nothing. Um, 13, report of staff. I have two things to say. One is congratulations to all of you who have been elected <laughs> officers of the planning board. And I will extend my help to you in any way I can, <laughs> as will my staff. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> We're looking forward to working with you. Um, the second thing is that John Hornick would like to come and speak with you about the Amherst housing policy mm -hmm. on October 2nd. So I just realized that you have scheduled Amir to be um, on, at 7.05, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we can squeeze John Hornick in first. If you want to meet at 6.30 or just squeeze John Hornick in in the beginning or how can we do this? It sounded like there was a pretty high chance that our, like the owner wants October 2nd, but the actual workers were like, Ew. Mike was shaking his head. <laughs> so uh, if you reach out to them, I mean, you can tell them, can we bump you, but they might even be going to the 16th. All right, we'll work it out. Because they want to come first, the housing committee. That they would like to come first. I mean, they could they could come later in the evening. That would be that would be okay. But um, how long do you think they want or need? I think they want a half hour. They oh. want to be able to present the policy to you, and then they want you to be able to have a discussion with them about what your take on it is. And um, we did send it out to you about a you month did. ago, right? Mm -hmm. So you can look for an email from late August from me, sending that to you. I printed and it, but I we'll send it again. I didn't. Read it yet. Yeah, and we'll copy it and put it in your packet. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, anyone else have anything else? Thank you, everyone. Uh, adjournment. Do I hear a motion? I move to adjourn. And I think Janet, I saw her hand <laughs> second it. So uh, all hands up. Yep, unanimous. Thank you.